Hi guys, this is Jeremy. Long time no see. It's been over a year and a half, I guess, since we last talked. Yes, the team did get into a bit of a spat to get the elephant out of the room. Um, but, you know, like all good teams, we came back together and put our personal differences behind us and put the, the goal of the team ahead of any one person's personal viewpoints. And um, more importantly, we're just, uh, we're back in action and kicking ass more so than I think I've ever seen from this team. So um, it's been really awesome being back when you're on a great team that's really passionate about what they do and, and really cares about the end product it really makes that difference between an average product and a potentially uh, epoch making experience and I, and I think that's what we're talking about on this team and I think you guys will start to see that sort of coalesce as we as we go forward here if you missed it uh, there was a little bit of a stealth announcement there in the uh, opening scene I hope you guys go back and catch that if you missed it um, and with that, that's kind of what's given us uh, the title for this episode, episode 36, Driven. That's where we're at. We're, we're extremely focused, razor sharp focused on the goal at hand. And the goal at hand is to get you guys a game. We really, really appreciate you sticking through this with us and kind of riding out the storm with us um, and being patient. So uh, with all that out of the way, let's just get right to it. AIGD 36 Driven. Oh, hello there. Ow! This is supposed to be cute, and he's fucking eating me. What the fu- is this your intro? Welcome to my beautiful half of my office. As you can see, it's been designed very well. Everything's in its perfect place. Okay, let's see. Yeah, let's just see it work. Alright, be free. Alright, let's so see let's... it. What am I looking at? Well, let's just say I have a free bone approach to this. <laughs> what the fuck so, does that mean? Say I want to make a poppy flower. Well, what I that's what that is, a poppy is flower? I, yeah, that's where opium comes from. You should know this. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, Anyways, I do. So I just Google red poppy. And I look at oh. all of these images of poppies, and I just observe them, and I just look at the way they look. And after I do that for about ten minutes, I come over here. Well, <laughs> it wouldn't be finished already. But anyways, I would open Photoshop, and I would zoom in like super fucking close and make, I don't know what size this is. I don't know. Just 32 by the, oh, yeah. No, I don't yeah, know. something like that. Thir oh shit. I don't, I don't know. know, whatever. Yeah, something like that. And then I come in here and I'm like looking at the colors and I find some colors that I like. And then <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> I fucking just like put one there, have a square for that one. Patrick, is this what you do? <laughs> and then. I kind of like shaped the outline first, kind of like made this rough outline. Oh, okay, okay. And then I kind of like go in and make like, see like, if I look at this picture, like there's some folds and shit. So I get mm -hmm. a darker color that's of the same like, family, so I'll just jump to a darker color like over here. Make some like creases in here, maybe some in here, here. And then I kind of like go in with the, like a tiny bit lighter, and like kind of go around the more inner side and then try to pop some highlights in wherever. I think some random stuff would go. <laughs> and then so, uh, <laughs> what exactly? So, you're working on like foliage. Like, maybe you should introduce them oh. to your. So, uh, she's, she's kind of the one who, like, is looking at the maps and is like, holy shit, these are bland as hell. And, uh, yeah, you remember when, uh, Lauren used to look like, um, not you, the other oh, Lauren? I was say, used to look like a concentration camp? Yeah, it's, uh,. She's gonna make sure that doesn't ever happen to again. Pretty, pretty, wait, prettyify, prettyify. Prettyify, prettyify, prettyify. Beautify. Oh, that okay. Was it. So yeah. yeah, she's gonna help us uh, make shit pretty. Work on the foliage stuff that Patrick definitely does not want to do. Indeed. Oh, and, and she's yet? part of. Uh, oh, oh, sorry. And she's part of a secret evil scheme to uh, appeal to the female audiences because. Uh, all of them hate me online. Wait, you can't say that because that is not a gender neutral statement. You could, like, men could be very flower oriented. You know? No. You can't say that kind of shit. We have to be a gender neutral zone. You can use whatever flower bathroom you want. 
why that doesn't make sense. Never mind. Anyways, so then I was like, oh, there's like a yellow dot in the middle. Well, I'm just going to make one square be the focal point, and then put some brown shit around it to be this like brown shit you see here for that part, All right. and then a stem and little shit right there. And then you can All zoom right. out, and you can see it actually like looks a lot better. It's weird when you work super zoomed in because you kind of have to like zoom out a lot of the times to like make sure. Like, are you looking at my screen? Yeah, kind of, yeah. Like, I get it. Right, when you're, like, super zoomed in. All right, in. I'm going to check back on you in a sec. Dude, zoom out. All right, I'm going to write some code. Wait, I'm not done yet. Hold on, I'll check on you in a sec. Hold on. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Jacob. Uh, I'm sorry if I'm hard to hear. Uh, I've temporarily lost my voice. Uh, I'm the new scripter for Lishian Shadows. I uh, work on AI, enemy items, as well as visual effects. I've been on the team for about a year, um, but I've been a fan since I was about 13. Um, how I got on the team was about a year ago. I messaged Falco, pretty much begging him to let me learn from him. I even like opted to just camp out in his yard for a week just so I could have the opportunity to learn from him. And uh, whenever he messaged me back, um, he said that he saw a lot of passion and heart for programming and game development and he agreed to teach me and he gave me a spot on the team um, that way I could learn through practice uh, so for the past year I've been going to school for engineering and trying to soak up some wisdom from the older members of the team since I'm kind of the young buck um, you know I come in with like a little bit of amateurity uh, but I'm learning and uh, I've learned a lot from everyone on the team, especially about grit, drive, motivation, uh, also about being an effective team member. Uh, I love that I'm able to work on this project and I'm honored to be on the team. Uh, it's my goal to bring you guys the quality scripts that you deserve. All right, so a lot of shit has changed since the last video. Uh, have a look around. Obviously, I'm in a different place now. Um, so I moved from uh, Redneckville, Alabama, where I've been ever since I was a child uh, in Adventure in Game Development Chapter 1. I moved to just outside of, what, Boston, Mass Boston Massachusetts. Uh, I got a job for AMD, so now I work on the uh, DirectX 12 driver team at AMD. Do you know what town we even live in? No, I could not tell. You. Burlington, Burlington Whatever. Coat Somewhere Factory. In, like communist Massachusetts. Anyway, so yeah, that's my wife recording. So now she's uh, sort of involved. Uh, this is the living room. Why are you filming the cats? Because they look cute. Not the star. It's dirty. I don't want to show them. Oh yeah, we so we haven't even like unpacked for shit at all. Well, like, we've unpacked, but we haven't here cleaned. Started coding basically. Here's my once proud. Uh, Library of Wisdom, yeah, it's kind of gone. Uh, I don't even have a Dreamcast hooked up right now, which is probably like the saddest thing I've ever heard. Uh, this is the new like dev room. I talked Lauren into letting us use the master bedroom for like game development. So uh, yeah, yeah. convincing. But this is actually the master bedroom, and uh, this is where I work now. This is where Lauren works. As you can see, the shitty ass apartment doesn't even come with like ceiling lights here, so. That's why there's all this extra light. Yeah, it sucks. Okay, and this is a luxury apartment. So uh, this chapter is kind of like a new beginning for uh, for Elysian Shadows, and for us, uh, we've been through a lot of shit. Like the uh, the Kickstarter was late. Uh, we had a bunch of people quit. Like we were lacking a bunch of key team members. Like really scripting and uh, level design. And these positions weren't really filled for a while, so so we kind of like dropped off the face of the social media earth. Not because we weren't working or anything, but because you know it's it's harder to show off what you, what you've been working on without you know like a level designer, and especially like what's the point of making something like Adventures in Game Development when there's there's a hole in the team there. Um, yeah, there's been all kinds of really just fucked up, uh, disgusting shit said about us in the press, especially. Uh, I mean, obviously, like we're but Marcel. <laughs> obviously, like we're late, and like we uh, we should be held responsible for that. And if anyone's pissed off at that, uh, then by all means, you're more than justified. But a lot of the shit is like is is people making shit up. It are things that that I may have said about people who were hating on the project, who were being like complete assholes and didn't know anything that was going on. And so yeah, I said some kind of like 
rude shit, and then those get turned into memes and twisted as though I said that to, to backers and followers and like really fucked up shit like that. So yeah, we kind of just got, or at least I got really fucking sick and tired of doing like the whole YouTube social media thing because it, it just, it became such a burden because it was so fucking fake because like we weren't rewarded any longer for, for even being here. And we could just as easily, you know, just keep our heads down and finish the goddamn game and then just pop up with a badass game instead of subjecting ourselves to all, all the bullshit, all the lies, the fucking memes, the bad press. But uh, after time went on and we got like new teammates, I, I really started to like rethink about it. And especially seeing, seeing how many of you guys like have stood by us and behind me after all these years and throughout, you know, mistakes that I legitimately may have made and seeing that you're still supportive and seeing that like that, that fan base that we built and that friendship with you guys is still there between us and the backers and stuff, that really made me want to, okay, like, this is still worth it to me. I want to get the fuck back on YouTube. Like, I don't give a shit about the haters, the bad comments. Like, one comment from from you guys, like, on a, on a you know, emotional level, supporting our work and, like, being involved in ES and being connected and shit like that, it's worth, like, a hundred of, like, the shitty, like, asshole haters who don't know shit about what we're doing and who just, like, oh, he's doing something epic. Like, he must, I fucking hate him. He's probably an arrogant piece of shit. So yeah, this is the first video that is legitimately for, for you guys. Like, this is my thank you. And uh, we plan to keep making them from now on and to do a, to do a much better job. But I just want to let you know where you're coming from. Jesus. Finally. So, finally, I unfucked this by... Um, it all started with this uh, curious question. I don't remember who was it, like Jeremy or maybe Falco, who said, Hey Patrick, can you implement facial animations in ESTK, in, in your spine skeleton for Elysian Shadows? I'm like, yeah, obviously. I mean, like, who do you think I am? Oh boy, little did I knew. Uh, little did I knew what a foolish of endeavor it was. Still worth it, mind you. It's still fucking amazing. But that was a lot of work. So to, to contextualize for you how much of a work it was, take a look at take a look at um, here the hierarchy. Thank God they actually have it written down because it's so late. I just cannot think. Um, you can see that the portion for the head and you know the hair and. Um, you know, various parts of hair and the eye and eyebrows, mouth, etc. This has as much complexity as the rest of the fucking skeleton. If not more. Like, it... I essentially doubled the complexity of the entire... I've doubled the complexity of the entire skeleton, but what now we can do is that we can no, not only have... Uh, we can not only have uh, uh, facial animations, we can have them dynamic. So, no, I still need to separate the pupils from the eyes. But you can easily imagine that, let's say, if there is like a, you know, a character in the scene and, you know, Julian starts talking with, with the character, so, you know, you start the conversation, but then maybe player is bored and he starts like walking around, the character who he's talking to, they can like follow, the eyes can follow who they are talking to. I will also see, because this is actually a very minor experiment, and you will probably see that in the same video if, that worked out, if not you will not, but I will see if I can add like a minor, I saw on Twitter one of the artists made fucking amazing thing with Spine, where they fake like uh, up to 30 degrees of rotation of the head, and essentially the way they do it, they, um, they have like the eye separate and the pupils and the hair has two parts, so essentially you, you, well I can't really show it for obvious lack of equipment in that area, but if you could imagine, oh I can present it on Julian, so like, like the front sort of like here would be first part and then back would be second, and then if I want to simulate the rotation of the head, all I have to do is to move both eyes a little bit to the side. Oh, that's ugly. Uh, I will have to think about that, how to counter it. I do have some ideas. Um, maybe like uh, this outline as a jawline. 
whatever. But you know, you can like move the eyes to the side and like the head, the the hair on the back, little bit back, like the other way, and the hair in the front the other way, and you can have pretty much like a approximately thirty degrees of rotation. So we can have dynamically characters dynamic re reacting, and you know now like we could like put like little cameras so you have like the the portrait is actually the sprite in the game, and we can like ah, oh, it's going to be fucking amazing. It's going to be fucking amazing, but I really want you to guys realize how much fucking work into it uh, went into it because when I started it, I thought it would be like a two weeks of work, and then it ended up being four months, and I'm pretty much done. I still have like a minor polish to do, and it's obviously exported for the guys, but holy shit, it's gonna be amazing, but holy shit, uh, my little dev office I've got. Uh, it's actually in my closet. <laughs> but I want to show my workflow and how I've been doing shit. And so Jeremy made this awesome fucking title score which I'll play a little bit of a sample. Uh, it's fine dude. Alright. I got you. I made the uh, the cutscene for it that plays right before the title menu plays. So it's got that build up. And you hear it in there and then like skip ahead. What I've been doing is uh I will sit there and play that over and over again and just making sure that I'm keeping in sync with the music how I'm uh, how I've got the cutscene going and there's several different parts to it and it's like a multi-layered effect and so the basis of it is Julian is like walking down uh, <coughs> up to the echo and then he ends up Clotting with it and then, or like picking it up, and then he's just like going crazy and spazzing for a minute. Meanwhile, like all the other characters just kind of sitting there with them, and there's going to be a part where like the other Julians are circling around them, which you'll see. I mean, it should play before actually, should play before you guys actually see the production part of it. So you get an idea and you've seen it. But I'll show you like a behind the scenes view of it. And pretty much what I've uh, what I've done is I listen to that over and over again. And then as you see as he's walking down, whenever the drum beat hits, his left foot, or which is actually his right foot on here is like hitting. And what I want to mimic is how soldiers, whenever they're marching, used to be they would uh, use drums and the bands to keep in sync. And I kind of want to mimic that in a way and then keep everything on sync with the music. So like the emotion that Jeremy evokes in the score itself is represented by what's going on in the actual cutscene. And that's why I've got so many multi-layered effects is because like you want to feel the build up. You want to see like the kind of things that going on in his head and like visions of the past before he gets to the echo and then at that point he's just like just really losing his mind a little bit and you know I just wanted to show that we're trying to pay attention to detail like in almost every aspect of it and really like viewing things close and delivering you guys like you know quality fucking work you know that's what we're about here at ES is doing something good no matter how long it takes and just making things better I guess right, that's the fucking rap <laughs> alright <laughs> alright we're back we're back with the, uh, the female do what I was trying to do is well I was making some pansies oh, that's pretty. and I started with purple and just kind of like had a scheme going so then I would so we can group them together and have like a whole like little I don't know like flower montage of, I don't know what you mm -hmm. call it. group of flowers anyways so I was like oh I can just copy the color scheme and make a different color well I shouldn't have a background on this but 
so this is the pink one, and I think. By the way, just so you guys know, she's a programmer for a living. See your shirt. They're probably like, what the fuck does oh, she do? Yeah. I stole this from your you zoom closet. Zoom in on your boobs. Uh, I do mass quantities of Coke. Yeah, that's my shirt. Not Coke. But yeah, she also does art. I don't want her touching my code base. I don't want her touching my code base. That's so some queefy stuff. She's going to do art. Yeah, that's definitely queefy. So, listen to this, guys. Kay. Instead of making my life super complicated and redoing this and flipping it through Photoshop or some bullshit, I used Falco's beautiful ESTK toolkit. Well, you almost forgot what it was called. <laughs> it's all right. Anyways, and I use that to flip the images in game, so I don't have to worry about doing that here. And I can also resize them, like make this super tiny, super tall, or make differing sizes in a little flower patch, so I can have like more uniqueness. So it's not like, oh, this is just shit, like re so repetitive and stuff. So it can actually just look unique. Right. And right. that's using Falco's too. Okay. Yeah. Which is actually easier to use in Photoshop. I fucking hate Photoshop. Oh, I thank you. I thank you very much. Tell so, we'll tell Adobe that. Also, I'm supposed to be making other shit besides flowers, but for some reason I'm only good at making flowers so far. I try to make mushrooms, and I try to make... Yeah, we're gonna have to work on that. Butterflies, and I try to make trees, and I kind of fucking failed. Or I gave funny. up, because it was too If hard. you made them more feminine, you'd probably be fine at it. I don't know it. why. I like flowers so much. But I also want to make like little critters, like little bunnies and shit. Yeah, that's the kind of shit we need. Yep, that's the kind of shit Lauren's doing. Okay, so this game is, you know, it has basically four party members uh, active at any one point. Or it can have up to four. So we've already said that we plan on supporting local multiplayer. And like, it was always in the back end and it was something I could, you know, if you have two controllers plugged in, then boom, like one of them controls player two. You can manage party members. It's kind of like Final Fantasy 12 is a really good example. I love the way they did it. You can have up to four party members active at once. And the one that you're not currently playing as, or, or the three that you're not, um, will be AI driven. And I'll get into like the AI later on and how basically you're configuring AI very similar to Gambit's in Final Fantasy XII. Right now we don't have that even, uh, that framework very, uh, very advanced. So like their AI is just like Chrono Trigger, you know, following the leader if you're not the main one. So you can swap in just during game, during uh, playback in real time just by pushing left and right on the D-pad. So I can swap to Julian, swap to Aaron, swap to uh, Brand. We want it to be like very, very easy, very, uh, very quick, you know. So if you have a boss, you might want to be the one playing as like the melee character, so you can like do the most damage nice. and like beat the shit out of them. But maybe you're about to die and you want to real quick swap to Aaron so you can cast a heal spell. You know what I mean? So depending on on um, what level of uh, of the party you want to control at any. Uh, one point in time is the one that you So what play. skill you want to take advantage of? Yeah, yeah. Well, when you're not in a multiplayer set. Oh. Yeah. So, uh, this is the party menu also, and um, what I was talking about too is these are your active party members. Uh, you don't have to have them all active. Maybe Rand. Maybe I don't want to activate him now. Maybe he'll get his ass beat. Uh, so I remove him from the party. I can remove an Aaron. So these are people who are benched, right? Mm -hmm. And later on, there's going to be more than four party members, and they can't all be active. So you'll have them on the bench. Oh, but one okay. thing that we wanted to do with ES that, like, I feel very strongly about is if your party dies or people die on the map, you can in real time swap them in and out and replace them from your bench. And the reason I like this is because in Final Fantasy XII, especially. It gives you incentive to care about party members that maybe I didn't really give a shit about. I didn't really like Vaughn. I thought he was kind of a fag, right? But since when all the people I give a shit about, when they die, I can swap to Vaughn, I still have an incentive to play as him. You know what I mean? I don't know if it's politically correct to say the F-A-G word anymore. Probably not. Not like gay, like I'm sure he's gay, but I just mean he's like a fag. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, you can do that. Oh, also you can swap the the order of party members like this, you know, you can, you can basically manipulate anything from the menu. Wait, and what does the order do? I mean, just like whatever order you want, like look, they're following in different order. Oh, cool. You see what I'm saying? I didn't, okay, I see. In a single player setting, it's swapping the order alone doesn't do a whole lot. You know, it's swapping in and out that does, but. Cool. Yeah.
just another take on the title music. This is kind of where it took me a good two, maybe, I don't know, four days, three or four days, I think, because I, I scrapped it and then I went back to a theme and then I tried a different theme and then finally ended up coming back to the original um, and kind of just blowing it out. But this is what I had when I first decided to abandon this theme. And it actually was pretty sweet. What do we got in here? Anything with... So I was working on some of the multiplayer stuff. We are in the dick bat shop. Wow. I have a little bit of uh, I have a little bit of an issue with the spine is basically depth calling its own ass right now because I'm trying to dynamically give it uh, 3D depth at runtime. Same there because it's only 2D and I'm not doing it quite right. So when I do a depth pre-pass, it accidentally cools off part of their body. Sometimes I'm on it. I'll fucking fix it. Uh, <laughs> Black like, I have an iPad? You're wrong, yeah. I, I didn't do any of these NPCs, I actually have no idea what they say. Whoa. Okay, so anyway, that's not the point of this. So the point is, uh, see, I'm controlling keyboard and controllers. So we've already discussed wanting to do local multiplayer for the characters that you're not currently controlling, right? So the way that we need to implement that is actually a little bit more complicated. Um, so in ES, we support like a whole fuckload of uh, accessories for input, like keyboard, mouse, uh, joysticks. You know, on iPhone, it's like touchpad and shit. And like that means that we can't just make assumptions that if you plug another device in, that's for player two. Like on Dreamcast, I could be selfish as hell, and I'm one dude. I get mouse, keyboard, oh, and controller. Oh, I didn't think about that. You know, and then another dude gets just a controller. You can't just like a dumbass. Oh, a slot two is player right. two. It's like we had to do a much more complex system like that. So, uh, where's my player two controller? Where the fuck did I go? Oh, okay. I don't know. This place is a shithole. Yeah, yeah, shut up. All right. Check this out, babe. So, this is my player two controller. See, it's not fucking plugged in. Let me turn this up. So, what happens is when you first connect a device like that, basically it comes in in a, a pending state. Like, you're, you're not yet controlling anything. And check it out. Here's the device attached generic sound. So, see, 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 listen, listen. Ooh, that's cute. Did it flash the. I, it's gonna have an icon later. So, I don't do that for mouse, keyboard, absolutely fucking everything, right? So, when I'm doing that, it's uh, putting player uh, two or whatever this controller is in a pending state so it can join the party. Cool. But it hasn't yet, like you can see. Uh, Wait, player on. one has connected, press start to join. Player one, as in player zero, is the first they one. They just moved the screen. This I was trying to film it. Oh, my bad. Look. Where are you going? Look. Ah! S SDL joystick attached. It's got all of the fucking information ever, whether it supports rumble, all that. Okay. What is so hots? Hots? Number of hots. What? Hats. Oh, shit. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> Jesus. Oh, shit. Okay, so... Player one, now this is attached. There will, there needs to be some kind of UI, like press start to play, basically, almost like arcade style push start. Oh, shit. Player two. You should turn the volume down. I almost had a heart no, attack. The point, I, the, I did it on purpose. Oh. So I don't scare the shit out of you. Okay. So yeah, that's how multiplayer works now. Wait, you literally scared the shit out of me. Like, I pooped my pants. Oh, that's absolutely adorable. But anyway, there you go. And the same thing would work like on Dreamcast with a keyboard and things like that, but it, it had to be a lot. And also, we couldn't make the assumption that when you when you do that, you immediately take AI away from the character, obviously, because you're playing it. And then we also have to be smart enough to, if your shit gets unplugged, you don't just want your other party members sitting there getting his ass beat like a dumbass, right? Oh, yeah. So it has to go back to AI-based, 
But once again, like, dude unplugs his controller, maybe because he's a dick and he has like five devices so someone else can play. Just because the controller is unplugged doesn't mean that you can automatically assume that the dude has left the party. You know what right, I mean? So that's that's right, other complexity right. this system had to handle. Jeez. How do you yeah, keep track of all these complex, complex situations? Uh, very complexly. Tools or engine? Look. Um, where the fuck is it? Oh, input device dump. I don't know menu. where you look. The menu. Input device dump. Oh, I see. see okay. All right. So if I do that, it'll give a rundown from the engine of every single thing attached and all their properties and shit. You see right here, libgyro device dump. Yeah. Cool. So you can see like what it sees: two joysticks, oh what's in port zero, port one. Nothing in these ports. You know what I mean? It's so it's formatted so, so it's, beautiful. Uh, it's all handy. It's I've got it handy. internally. Oh yeah. All right. Another one of my little experiments uh, that I did this or last month, like recently, that I hasn't really talked on my HD yet, um, is this little boat. And you might be asking, like, what the fuck is the thing with it? The perceptive of you may already notice something, which is like here when the ores are coming. And the great thing about it is that it's a 3D thing. It's a free, like, it's 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 a two-dimensional thing with no 3D whatsoever, just overlaid like layers of both that can rotate in 3D space. And I'm like, if this if this doesn't blow your mind, then I don't fucking know. But for the longest time, the issue with rotating objects, like long objects in the NES, was that, well, it's kind of hard to rotate them. Like we can we can rotate like if, if you have like a standing thing, right? We can rotate it like that, no problem whatsoever, because like that's that's one axis. But like trying to do if you have like long object which is technically like lying down, and if you would want to rotate it and still make it look 3D, like you know, the show the sides where it's needed, like it's it's borderline fucking impossible. Uh, it it actually is impossible unless you make this little trick. And with this one thing, um, as long as the thing is not animated, so you can see that the ores are moving, and you will think like, oh, be a Patrick, that's animated. Um, yeah, kind of. When I mean what I mean by animation is like um, like a rat. Uh, running or a horse or a dog, you know, so you have like limbs moving and stuff like that like very bio very very biology biological movement this sort of mechanical movement um, Is like very simple so With this approach and the greatest thing about it is that it's not a complicated thing like it's not like super Basically what I did and this is like this is the fucking genius of it is that those are just like sort of slices of both. Fuck, I'm I'm moving around things. I need to select the bones. Um, let me. How can I? Oh, I know. I will like disable this. Okay, now I can select the bones. So, those are just slices, like sort of like horizontal uh, slices of an object that are overlaid on top of each other. And that's just fuck. Like, let me. Let me like separate it more. So you have like the very bottom of a boat, and then you have like slightly higher, and then you have slightly higher. Fuck, I need to like stretch it even more. Uh, but you get the idea, right? And basically, what they have is that that each of them is moving, uh, like each of them is rotating, and like they're slightly, as you can see, they're slightly offset of each other. So actually, you're not seeing a side; you're seeing the underneath layer a bit of it. Right? But because of the unified color and because of the lack of texture, it looks like side of a boat. And when it rotates, the, I maintain the offset and I'm just like rotating key, each of them. And because of the uh, because of the obvious differences in sizes, it looks like it looks like a you know 3D objects animated. And I still need to do some testing, like actually in game, like as a proof of concept, it works. But I need to make sure that it works well when you put Julian on it and when you put this boat in 3D space and the perspective looks. Because for now it looks very top-down-ish. Yeah? And I wonder is this enough for the game? But if it is, like if it doesn't look too much off, suddenly we can have all kinds of different cool objects in the game that weren't possible before. And the best thing about it is that this can be, this can be controller-driven. 
Like, it doesn't have to be predeterminated animation for the turning. You can simply, like, take your fucking controller, yeah? And, and like, move your analog stick to turn it, and you're gonna have, like, all of the little precision that you have with analog movement. So, this is just mind-blowing, and we could, like, put... We could have cards in it, like, mine cards, like, like all sorts of amazing stuff. So, this is, like, experiment that I'm really proud of. It's really, really promising. And I cannot wait until we will have opportunity to implement it in the game. Um, because, you know, I'm not fond of doing stuff for the sake of doing stuff. Like, we actually need... And there is actually an ocean zone uh, that I started working pixel art... Uh, that I started wor doing pixel art on. Like, this, this sort of, like, seaside ocean zone that would be perfect for the boat. Because then you can, like, you, know, you, you could, like, boat between different individual houses and boat, like, row your way to the dungeon. I mean, oh my god, like, we have, like, fucking... Uh, Legend of Zelda Wind Waker, like a Simbini. I, I go, I'm just, I'm just so excited, to just fucking, fucking test it. So you know, that's like, that's like another exciting little project that I did recently. Uh, for those of you who have heard me blather on about who my musical inspirations are, Vince DiCola is one of my favorites. He's the uh, composer for the Transformers uh, movie, but in Unlike me, he's a really, really talented synth player, uh, piano player. He was actually a percussionist by trade. Um, and for those who don't know, pianos are percussive instruments, so I guess it kind of makes sense. But uh, yeah, he's just really great at what he does. And I got the inspiration, particularly like the opening part of the battle theme, uh, from him. And I'll show you uh, both tracks. All right, let's so check this out. This is Saturday morning RPG. I can't really speak for the quality of the game. Uh, I hear it's kind of middle of the road, but the soundtrack is freaking exciting. It's awesome. So let's see. Let me click through a few of these and find the one that inspired my battle theme. Okay, sort of a Top Gun thing. Yeah, there you go. Did you hear the the beginning of that? Sort of a little French horn, timpani roll kind of thing going on? Melodic bass line. And uh, probably if I have any kind of a calling card, I hope what it is, is that I love my bass lines. Um, and particularly you'll hear that in uh, the Crystal Ruins theme has some great bass lines in it. Uh, Lauren, the original Lauren track, the one that got deprecated, has some great bass lines in it. Uh, but the Mines, which I'll show you in a second, also have that. So let's, let's play that one more time and then I'll remind you. Oop, this one. And see if you can hear the inspiration when I pop back over here and I play this theme. So, yeah, uh, you can clearly hear the inspirations there. Uh, not a direct copy. Actually, I don't know. I guess in music, I guess we're all kind of copying each other when you say you're inspired by a piece. I guess that's really what you're saying. But Vince also has a lot of quote-unquote inspirations, uh, especially from uh, prog rock uh, groups and stuff like that, some of the greats there. So Emerson, Lake, and Palmer in particular. And I think he actually had the opportunity to meet one of the musicians there. And uh, his the musician listened to his music and gave him the compliment that every musician who's inspired by somebody wants to get, and that is your music doesn't sound... It sounds like you got some ideas from mine, but it sounds like your own creation. So I hope that's what uh, Vince says to me when he hears my battle theme. Uh, let's see, what else? Let's um, stroll through some of these. All right, we've got the Floyd Day, which you guys have all heard. Floyd Knight, uh... I might let these just kind of roll more in the section that Jacob is going to show off with the gameplay element, but let's see here. We've got indoor and outdoor themes, so slightly muffled if you're in a building. This one kind of opens very similarly as the, uh, to the daytime theme. So let's... And then it's got some interesting sections here. It's just kind of a slow crawl. It's not a crazy, interesting, fast-paced, frenetic song or anything like that. And here's the theme kind of in a different key. What was that Final Fantasy uh, 14 level? Uh, Old Duh. Yeah, the desert one. 
Man, when I first walked in there and those bright brass, sort of those trumpets and, and mellophones just hit you in the face. Dun, 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 dun. And then you get sort of those runs uh, from the uh, the string section and whatnot. Oh, man, it was just so regal and badass. I mean, we, hands down, the best uh, town theme in the game until you hear the nighttime theme. And so, you know, I just... It's just, it's so great to walk into an area that you're going to spend a lot of time in and get different looks, get different takes on uh, that particular song. And uh, I think that's something Final Fantasy XIV did a really good job with. And certainly it wasn't the first game to do that. It's just the one that comes to mind. And I think we'd be doing ourselves uh, and our fans a disservice if we didn't at least try to do the same thing with our theme. So that's what we're going to do. So, this is what we call the graphical test area. Actually, we don't call it that. They look like Pokeballs. Yeah. Oh my god. No, don't say that. No, um, they look like boobs. So There's a nipple in the middle. Jesus Christ. Alright, listen. What happens is when we work on areas with like all the new lighting effects and how much shit that can impact each other, when something doesn't look right, like a reflection looks off or like, you know, the light doesn't look the way you should, we don't know whether I fucked up on the shader side or Patrick fucked up on the asset side. You know what I mean? So we've created this as like kind of like the uh, the base test case cool. of basically all the different effects that we can use. So uh, this is just like the area that we can use. So if this looks good, you know, then the shaders are right because this is a known good case for assets. It's like the cycles of the moon. So this is all... One flat ass fucking basically like 2D plane. And you see how it looks pretty polygonal? Polygonal? Polygamous? Yeah, it looks see? like it has three looks dimensional like it has, like, stuff. Like it's like a yeah, right. push button. Good, good. That means uh, my or like renderer, What was that candy with the little means my renderer's right. the sheets of candy where it's like little button things? Alright, anyway, moving on. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, what you're seeing here is, first of all, obviously this has normal mapping. What we've also done is, in addition to normal mapping, he's also added, uh, we've also added a depth channel. So not only are we giving every fragment a direction for the 3D uh, light equations to hit, we're also able to actually say the position of each pixel is offset this much in each direction, right? So like, it's normal mapping plus depth. I don't know if that was depth mapping. I, I get them fucking confused. But anyway, that also helps make it look way the fuck more 3D. Cool. So in addition to that, we have uh, the bloom, obviously the high dynamic range. Uh, part of that also is uh, the specular reflections. You see how these look kind of like glossy? The as though hell is that it? As though they're metallic. Specular reflections yeah, are, are right. a type of reflection where most reflections are relative to the direction of the light, right? This is like a light, like the sun yeah. moving. But specular reflections are relative to the person viewing it too. So the blue is the directional aspect of the light, whereas the white, the metallic-y looking yeah. gloss, is the specular. So watch as I move and our view position changes, watch the white. Ooh, see it? Yeah. See it moving relative to the viewer? Yeah. Alright, so that's the that's the specular aspect. Cool. But the the point of this is that we have a gradient showing how specularity and glow from an asset level interact. Mm -hmm. So uh, in this dimension, on the X dimension, this has no specularity. This is full specularity. Yeah. Right? And then I forgot because these obviously aren't bloomed. This has no uh, glow. Wait, there's a two way around. Dang, it, look, it looks so much better in real life. Like, this camera does not do it justice. Yeah, yeah, because it's low dynamic range. Not that my monitor's not. But anyway, in this direction, we have specularity. Actually, we don't. I think in this direction is specular. Yes, this direction is increasing the specularity. This direction is increasing the glow. Hmm. So this is like basically just directional has like no specularity, no bloom. You see, that's the base yeah. case. This has all the specularity, no bloom. Uh, the one on the bottom right has no specularity and all bloom. And then this is just the fucking shit show one of all specularity and all, all, all bloom. Extreme. Right, so you can see how they all interact. So now we know when shit Reese whose fault it is. Cool. And it'll always be Patrick's. Ha, <laughs> poor Patrick. 
Alright, let's talk the importance of experiments uh, and, exp and actually the importance of trying something if you know that you can fail just to see how exactly you can how exactly the thing fails. Um, so when I made the boat experiment, I was think I kept thinking about how could I use this idea of having uh, basically being able to have rotations, very fluid rotations in pixel art. And I was thinking that uh, you know having like those columns in lava dungeon that you could actually tip over and you could like jump on them and walk through lava that would be really cool. But in order to have you know very fluid like tipping point, it would be you know making it frame animation would be really time consuming because I would have to draw every single frame of the rotation. Or alternatively, I could do something like that, which you know gives us very fluid 3D. Um, almost 3D-like simulation of the rotation. The problem with this is, though, that it has... it has, like, what? 18, 17 layers. And 17 quads, that's 34 tricks, if I if my math is correct, which, you know, by this point, I don't even trust myself to add one-to-one. -one. But the point is, is that it's a lot of polygons, uh, and it doesn't even do all the rotations. So you know, I can I can easily tip the column to the side, I can tip it to the back, but I cannot tip it to the front because. And let's now you know let's now reveal the trick. Mm, somewhere here, and start uh, whatever I can yeah, I can do it here. So let's 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 reveal the trick and show actually what's the what's the magic behind. So you can see again, as in the case with the boat, I made the slices of the column and it progresses with the rest of them. I'm, I won't gonna show every single 27 layers because that's a... sorry, 17 layers because, you know, all of them, most of them look the same. It's only the front and the few, the, the, the few first ones that are interesting uh, because, you know, they have some freedom, uh, freedom, free dimensionality to it, I don't know, words, difficult. The point is, is that it's not all that flexible, like, while it's better than literally drawing the animation frame by frame, it's uh, still quite inflexible, whereas, like, you know, in the case of the boat, it was really useful because the boat is only rotating this way, we don't rotate the really boat this way or that way, so, you know, it was it was enough for the boat, but for something that we want to rotate like here and then back and then to the sides, it's just not enough. And I remember a few years ago when Falco was mentioning that actually adding the support for bona fide 3D models for the SDK wouldn't be all that hard because our engine is technically 3D anyway. Well, not technically, practically, it's, it's, it is 3D engine. We're just using sprites in there. And recently there were a lot of games which are using pixel art and 3D models to great effect. Uh, for example, the game by Team Sore. Uh, if I'm pronouncing the guy's name correctly, he's amazing inspiration. A French game developer, uh, from what I understand, is like a programmer slash pixel artist slash technical artist, which is basically what I am. But he's is you know like even more out there which is it's amazing it's amazing to have someone as an inspiration and by this point like uh, when i made this column i showed it to falcon and, you know everyone really loves it but uh, and and i told him what i said now and and my closing remarks were were so really model and yeah, essentially the long story short is that we can have 3D models and... Oh, by the way, also like another benefit would be that making this column took me three days. Uh, making a 3D model of it with pixel art uh, map would be two hours. And it also would be less quad because it would be... Okay, let's, so let's, let's, let's count the sides. It's like four, four here, four, four here, that's eight, and another four. So that's 12 plus top, 13, 14. 20, 28 quads. Yeah, so com 28 compared to 34, that's a lot better, and that would be a lot flexible, and we would, we would have the full range of the rotation, so we could have like a, we could, we could use it for three logs and like rotate the, amazing, we could do amazing things, so, and, and faster, so, you know, that's great. 
but still it was it was important for me even though I knew that this column wouldn't be doing all the things that I wanted it to I really wanted to see how exactly it would fail and what would what would do and what it would not do so you know this rotation I mean, looks looks it looks so beautiful and you can see the you really can see the 3dness on the on here it's, it's just marvelous and then you know rotating to the back is also really nice but yeah it will be it's going to be better as a 3d model it's going to be faster to make and i hope that we can use that uh, technology and that solution in a lot of parts of the game to make it even more visually stunning, unique and amazing. So yeah, uh, thank god that Falco was thinking ahead and he, like all those years ago he knew that I would put this sort of bullshit. <laughs> so we're gonna have a, yeah, we're gonna have a 3D models in pixel art and I will make sure that it actually follows uh, the aesthetic, it doesn't look out of place, it has, you know, all the bells and whistles, whistles and it's as beautiful as, as I can make it. So, hi, this is Jacob, or J Chill, and I wanted to talk a little bit in depth what I do as the gameplay engineer for Elysian Shadows. Uh, honestly, I have a variety, and the type of tasks that I'm assigned and the work I get to do, which is really rewarding. Uh, makes it to where I'm never bored and I'm constantly learning something new uh, as I work on things. Um, so as I've mentioned before, I get to work on environment stuff, AI, combat, and I even get to make a few tools and utilities which help us out with that. To really give an idea of what my role is, uh, use this metaphor, Falco makes like the blueprints. Um, and our artists, Jeremy and Patrick, they bring in the raw materials. And I, as a gameplay engineer, put things in a workable fashion so that we can all work together to put together the finished product. Um, just to give you an idea of the work that uh, I've done in this video, or for this video rather, is for particles and environment, uh, I've animated the water and the areas, and I've also animated the waterfalls as well as created like a waterfall splash type particle, which if you look at waterfalls in real life, whenever they hit the bottom, it creates like a mist that kind of shoots up in the air, and I want to re recreate that visual. Um, as well as Falco has been doing a lot of work on the lighting and we have a fireball that you're able to shoot out as a fire spell and I want to make a particle that really complements the things that he's been doing with the lighting. Um, try to make it as semi-realistic as possible. You'll notice that there's some flicker in it kind of like a real flame would be so that it gives that illusion of you know like okay it's flashing back and forth um, I've also been able to create the warps and link the different areas together. So I'm actually getting to place like the little different jigsaw puzzle pieces of the world and I put them together in a fashion to where that we can show you now that you're able to explore the world um, of Volition Shadows. I've also been able to work on items and chests and loot and stuff like that. So now you're able to explore the world. You come across a chest and you're able to collect items and loot from it and also whenever you kill an enemy you know they spawn various items that you know can be sold some of it can be key items and um, speaking of enemies uh, for this video we have three enemies ready to go which are the angry plant which is your kind of stationary type enemy um, he's more or less there for whenever the roaming enemy is like the rat and the boar uh, kind of push you toward an area or you might just walk by them they kind of ensnare you and you know just kind of like tack you down and the rat is meant to be a faster type enemy but it doesn't deliver as hard of a hit while the boar is a bit of a heavier enemy but he's a little bit slower um, so our enemies in the game are going to be a little bit dynamic and they have specific roles uh, and the way they attack, just like their real life counterparts would interact with you like wild and feral animals would do. Um, as far as utilities goes, 
I've made a nav graph module so so we can get in pathfinding and have you know that going for the AI as well as a line render which helps me with a nav graph and I've also used that line render for a fence maker uh, which lets us create different kinds of uh, boxed off areas and fences uh, gives a really cool effect. As far as cutscenes go I've done the area introduction cutscene so whenever you get to a major area there'll be like a little uh, little cutscene that plays kind of giving you an overview of the general path uh, of travel and where some major key point areas are and then uh, the scene and the biggest one was the title sequence that one was both the longest most tedious but also one of the most rewarding uh, things I've got to do for this one um, and uh, without further ado uh, I'll show you that now looks cool all right so we have like a, a day night system um, and like weather and shit like that so with the high dynamic range stuff, I'm trying to make like a like a moonlight effect, you know, for when it's night. Mm -hmm. So I'm actually kind of just using the logic like of the sun right now. Yeah, yeah, but we want it like they want all be this epic looking, but you know, some some can look like surreal, like you know, like Whimsical. dreamy kind of shit. So I like that. I've kind of like modified the way the sun works right now, so it's actually directionally based, but like you can see like. It's kind of like the sun, but check it out. So, sliding just into high dynamic range, and you know, putting a little bit of extra blue, and uh, basically changing the tint of what was the sun to blue green, and sliding into high. Oh, that looks good. Dang, into it looks, high dynamic range. It doesn't look as good on the camera. God damn it! That really sucks. Anyway, yeah. so now you can see like we have like just enough to push a lot of things that are more white into uh, into bloom and then everything else has like a nice blue tint blue green tint you can see like as it see watch it's starting to get bloomed as it intensifies right mm -hmm. so that, that's like a sweet spot of what looks actually really good so this would be really good for a, a like nighttime effect this level's a little reasted but I'm gonna save this so we can use it for like a Fucking David Bowie serious moonlight shit. <laughs> I like the way the water looks, that looks good. The white. Damn it, it doesn't look right on the camera. That is so depressing. This doesn't look badass. It looks really good in person. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> Great. Get wrecked. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so this is the Mines track. Uh, the one I told you has a pretty interesting bass line going on. Um, this one kind of starts out with some thunderous drums. Kind of setting the tone. And I, I got on a kick because I got this new drum rack that sounds badass so i just got into a thing with these toms little chip tunes jazziness going on kind of reminiscent of uh, enigma from the 90s the principles of lust i don't know if you guys know that song but i kind of got these kb vibes from that one And then we're going to cut it up with a little chip tuny drum rack here in a second. This is where the bass line kicks. So yeah, when you're making a song like this and you want an interesting bass line, it really pays, i found, to um, go the Vince DiCola route. And that, dude, talk about a guy who has interesting uh, bass lines. But check this out. So like, let's try to single out a couple of these here. Um, what's this guy got on it? Is this, you know? <laughs> Yeah, so let's try to, um, man, let's back this thing up. And you'll notice, like, there's this idea of in music called the tonic. Um, 
and following the the chord uh, structure kind of around. So you'll notice like this thing starts out. <laughs> So on these like hits here at the beginning of each measure, you'll notice that this other bass line up here follows that. So what you get is this, is this sort of like dronish um, sound if you play it independently like this. And you'll notice that those notes, they're not as flowing as the other one was, but it's sort of the beginning note of that run. So that sort of flow, that first note of each phrase. Right? And it sort of follows and, and supports that, um, that more flowing bass line. And when you put the two together, they sound a lot better. Um, let me put the controller or the uh, camera down for a second and get both of these in at the same time. Okay, cool. I've got those both soloing or duetting, I guess, in this case. Let's play them together. Yeah, so you kind of get the sense for like those two things kind of supporting each other, right? And then you, when you put the whole thing together, um, there's something called getting lost in the mix. And you'll notice that when you put all the, like how many layers do we have on this? Like 15 or something? Or maybe even more than that. Um, when you put it all together, things have a tendency, there's a synergy that happens. And things that sounded almost too rough or... Or I guess my dog has an opinion on this one as well. And what I was trying to say before my, my dog decided to perform his own little solo there is that when you put two sort of almost disparate sounds or more sounds together, there's kind of a synergy or a magic that happens when it's in the mix. And you'll notice that uh, you'll have to bring certain things forward or tone certain things down to get that nice magic happening. But when you play it all together as a cohesive unit, you'll get something that uh, sounds like this. Yeah, so again, you know, there's no emphasis on any one instrument there. It's just kind of all mixing and supporting and, and sort of like a, you know, a Broadway musical where everybody has their little part to sing and it all comes together to smack you in the face as, uh, as a cohesive unit. So let's see here. We've got um, some interesting things going on as well uh, with these like anvil strikes down here. And I went with like these anvil strikes because it's a mine, right? It's you imagine there's pickaxes swinging back and forth, hitting rock, dirt and stone, um, sort of grinding away, monotonous, brutal sort of uh, physical labor kind of thing happening with these anvils. So. And again, you might not have noticed it had I not pointed it out. Well, in the mix, I bet you'll notice it now. Yeah, so, you know, the key there is to not overdo it, of course, so I don't do it throughout the whole song. You can see that I've got these little gaps here um, and whatnot, but let's see. Let's scroll on through. Scroll on through to the other side. What do we got here on? Yeah, so again, you know, I've got movements in my song, right? This is the one that's highly experimental. Got this waltz, this chiptunes waltz. Kind of like a mad carnival kind of situation going on there, right? Um, that gives way to more of like a sort of uh, solo drum section here. Um, sounds like this. Right? And then we slowly creep back into the picture here with a little bit harder hitting guitar licks here. 
So those off beats. And then we bring the melody slowly back into the picture here. And you hear that bass line sort of following and supporting that main melody. Okay, so yeah, that's kind of how I approached the Minds music. It's very late at night, but uh, guess what? I've got everything done. All of the, all of the front-facing faces. So we have, uh, we have like an idol. We have a happy face. We have angry face. Really fucking pissed, by the way. Like, <laughs> you, you don't want to mess with this guy. Uh, we have also no, which you know can be later modified to actually position the head on this axis however we want. We have uh, obviously yes because you know you want to agree sometimes with people, and you know we have good old talking, and also we have just generally a base for adding way more. Um, facial animations basically as needed, like the only limit I have is the amount of pixels. So for example, for um, for the happy one, I was fiddling with making smiles, let me, let me check, face, mouth, yes, yeah, so it's like a base mouth, uh, like little bit, you know, open, more, uh, yeah, that's more open, and, you know, that's, uh, mm, doesn't doesn't really look good, so I guess just like that's gonna be that's gonna be another open view. Just, you know, if you if you're gonna look at this from this from this this looks you know looks pretty happy, pretty content with life. Uh, whereas uh, whereas this it's kind of okay. Not the best, but you know it, it looks kind of okay. <coughs> As I said, I was playing with like different shapes of mouth and the fact that I have only essentially four pixels and I can't really put the pixels those to here because then you start merging with the chin. I actually had a um, first iteration of smile which was sort of like pixel um just like pixels he here and then going here and Julian was looking like he has like a double chin that is like super fucking fat. So you know uh, not the ideal scenario. But regardless it's it's whew. I was. It's funny because there was so much work for so little apparent effect, but that give uh, that gives us very good basis. Plus, you know, I d I did other cleanup with the um, with the thing because after all, we've been we've been developing, we've been with this uh, skeleton for like what four five years, and obviously five years ago I wasn't as good as I am now, and that was quite a big technological depth. Um, which would only grow bigger and bigger, so that was uh, that was really really good thing to do to do this refactor. And as I said, now we have endless possibilities, which is amazing. Hallelujah! And it's now time to sleep. So see ya, and watch out for those facial animations because I put way too much work into that. All right, so the wife's at work, so, uh, or no, she's not. She's at yoga. It's the weekend, so I guess I'm recording my own bitch ass. Uh, look at that nicely animated water. Uh, so, I wanted to show something off. So, let's see, you can go to view, um, VMU view. So, the Elysian VMU emulator that you guys know that, uh, I've been working on has been... 100% fully integrated with the STK. That's the Japanese BIOS. So what does this mean? This means that uh, most of us are developing on PC and Windows and uh, Mac and all that shit. We don't have access to a VMU. So how are we going to be testing like the uh, VMU content and the icons and shit? Well, with the EVMU emulator. So uh, this is also 
uh, how it's going to work if you have like a smartphone or a, or a tablet or something and you want to use that as your VMU device. Basically, uh, basically in the engine you just give it your IP address. In the engine, in the game you give it the IP address of your phone or whatever on the local network and uh, it'll be used as your VMU device. So now we go to... Right now it's just in VMU mode. I could just play like whatever game I want on it. It thinks it's disconnected. So the engine you want to connect to EVMU. So boom. Now uh, when you connect a VMU to uh, the game, you first see the Elysian Shadows logo. And then uh, once you've done that, we don't have many VMU icons right now, but uh, we should have them done for all the party members. So this isn't necessarily what you're going to be seeing on the VMU display, but for now, uh, swapping party members. Um, oh, not that controller. It shows their icon, so uh, right now I'm Aaron. Aaron's on the VMU. Right now I'm Rand. Rand's on the VMU. Right now I am, uh, what's his face? Alexios. Alexios is on the VMU. And Julian. Julian's on the VMU. So it's swapping based on your character. Um, VMU, uh, yeah, it's also used, uh, if you use it on your phone or whatever, or obviously Dreamcast, it's also going to... Uh, double as a file save device, you know, so you can bring your phone over to your buddy's house and that has your VMU save, or that has your Listing Shadows save file on it, which you can then use to play multiplayer and then bring it back home with you, so you'll kind of have it wherever you go. Same with the VMU, and it's all emulated, so the phone is literally going to have 100% the exact same functionality as what the VMU does as a display uh, as, as a display device, as an audio device, as a storage device. And then aside from that, we're going to have at least one mini game which will use it, which you use it standalone, you know, so you'll be able to play that on your VMU or your phone completely independently of Elysian Shadows, something like a Chow Garden ish uh, concept, and then you can put it back on later. Let me make sure that, like, the day night looks. Because I was fucking with the sun value in here. Sorry, totally unrelated, but I can push Alt M and make, like, the time elapse. These trees aren't oriented correctly in 3D space yet, so I gotta. We gotta work on that. Uh, P swaps us to perspective camera. Uh, a lot. What we have to do with Elysian Shadows, basically, is to create the area in 2D, like, as you would normally do, um, any 2D game with like RPG Maker, Game Maker, or anything like that, you make the tiles in 2D, but then after you do that, we have to orient it in 3D space, or the lighting looks off because it's literally flat. So that's that's the second phase uh, when we make levels. So this one, for example, is not complete there. That's why the shadows are not being cast properly because it's all flat. All right, my hard drive sucks, so it's taking forever to load this Ableton Live prod <clears throat> project. But let's go through some of these like sound effects that I've got going on here. Let me move that thing out of the way because it's stubborn and wants to like occupy my screen and hijack my computer, which isn't nice. But so yeah, let's see here. We've got I did these last night actually. Let's see a device connect sound effect. So when you connect a controller to <clears throat> Listen Shadows, not when you hit the start button to join the party or anything like that. But when their controller is detected by the software, you'll get something like this. Disconnect. Sweet. A um, couple more down here. We got a player connect. So we want to make it so that you connect that controller up and somebody is in the middle of, um, and Falco will show this in his clip, but if somebody's you know in the middle of doing an adventure and you got a second player who joins in, we want plug and play, instantaneous swapping between AI and player control. And so when that guy hits start, it's going to sound like this. Sweet. So it's sort of like a little brass, a brass version of that, that flute kind of thing that we had for the device connect. Awesome. So let's see what else we got in here. Start game, which you heard <clears throat> in the intro, but I'll play it here again. Nice little trailing echo effect. What do we got here for uh, other sound effects? So here we've got uh, a couple of spell sound effects, or more than a couple, but let's see, what do we got here for rays? So kind of um, 
you know, like a tape rewinding kind of effect, you know, you when you're raising somebody from the dead, it is kind of like rewinding to a point in time when they were still alive. So that's what I was striving for with that one. That was really fun to make to kind of like play something a certain way and then just flip it around and reverse the, uh, the flow. <laughs> Uh, oh yeah, here we go. Save Crystal. This one was fun to make, man. Like, Falco was like, can you give me... It's so hilarious, man. When he asks me for sound effects, he has a way of, like, spelling it out the way it sounds. And somehow it just kind of makes sense. What he usually does is he'll say, hey, man, you know in Final Fantasy XII, because that's one of his favorites, you know Final Fantasy XII when you, like, pick up that orb or you just pick up that little dinky thing that really doesn't mean a whole lot, but it's just kind of like the slightest little bloop. That's what I need for this particular sound effect. And for the save point, it was kind of more like, hey, man, you know, Final Fantasy XIV, right? When you're next to that save crystal and it's got sort of a humming sound and like almost like uh, sort of a radioactive magic energy coming from it, kind of a windy thing. And so that's what I did here with this save crystal. Uh, and it was fun to make this. I was actually um, dangling some... Uh, I think at the time I made this, it was actually around Christmas. So I had like ornaments still hanging around. So I took a glass ornament and kind of dangled the hook end of it and made it sort of click against the ornament and added some wind effects. And actually, the wind effects are me wringing my hands together, if you can believe it. And I probably shouldn't tell you that before you hear the sound effect because then you'll know how it's done and you'll, you'll hear those things. But try to imagine not knowing that. And this is what we have. Let me turn that up a little bit so you guys can hear that. So here we go. So it's got that sort of humming energy and sort of like um, almost like a Tibetan sort of mountain pass sort of uh, wind effect, you know, kind of... Um, dangling wind chimes or something like that um, going on so that was that was a lot of fun to make anything else in here worth talking about so yeah i think that pretty much does it on sound effects all right so while we were on the topic of the uh, vmu integration i just loaded up some random mini game here so it's in standalone mode right now um vmu pac-man's loaded um in the spirit of elysian shadows and everything we're trying to do with this game you know like pushing the envelope of what we can do with like old school music and uh, pixel art and shit like that. Uh, I implemented a little something in EVMU that is for uh, Jeremy, our musician. So, uh, you know, we want to use this as a little audio device when it's plugged into the controller. And then when we have a standalone game, obviously, we're going to have to have some kind of uh, either sound effects or like music or you can't do much with music, but something along those lines. So what I've done is I've created a tone tool for the uh, little piezoelectric buzzer inside of it because I really don't think Jeremy's going to want to have to uh, code audio effects in 8-bit Sanyo LK6800 assembly or whatever. So what this window does is here you can set the pulse period in, in milliseconds, you can set the duty cycle in milliseconds. This gives you the frequency of the sound that's being generated. And then those two uh, hex numbers are what the registers are set to to do that. So you can go through and try to create different, uh, find the uh, register settings to create different frequencies and get the notes you want. And then later on, this is going to be the composer area where you can basically just string the tones together and make like little tracks and shit like that. So without further ado, let's see this bitch running. Uh, push play. You hear that? Does that sound familiar? That happens to be the sound you always hear when the VMU is first plugged into a Dreamcast. And that is basically, I believe, the highest tone the VMU can generate. Go figure, it's kind of annoying. It's literally the highest one. So, we can slide this. And it's generating different uh, frequencies of notes. This is increasing the frequency, decreasing the frequency. So you can just kind of get a view for uh, the range of the VMU here. And yeah, from this, uh, see what Jeremy can do. 
It's definitely not quite as uh, quite as capable of, as like an NES or something, but uh, you know, you actually can do. I was looking at like the Mario Brothers theme. You can do with a few slight modifications. You can do that to some extent with this. Oh, also, it's kind of funny. I just want to mention uh, someone was fucking. I was showing uh, Tulio from uh, from uh, Pure Solar this tool and like what we could do. And uh, someone asked if uh, the VMU can play chords, which is like, uh, yeah, fuck no, this is not even real, like, audio creation, like, wave level, this is just like a little tiny buzzer. But then we got to thinking, we're like, oh, wait a fucking minute, so you have a Dreamcast where each controller has two different VMU slots, and you have four controllers, right? And so Tulio's like, wait a minute, we can have a fucking VMU symphony going on here with eight VMU devices beeping in like perfect synchrony. So I thought that was kind of fucking hilarious. So yeah, we'll see what the, the audio quality is of uh, VMU effects and Elysian Shadows. So I'm putting less of the finishing touches on the um, change the hair animations that I'm going to implement along with facial animations and the general refactoring of the skeletal animation for Elysian Shadows, which will make it both Easier to use, easier to make, and generally less of the pain he has to uh, create a mankain. So before I had uh, four frames of animation for the hair for each of the directions, and you know that's always four hour, four times of work for any given hair animation. And well, it looks okay because you have like a little animated hair, as you could see on the Julian. But the problem with it is, is that well, it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of space on the t on the character sheet because you have like the hair is the biggest single piece and it's pretty square, so it just takes a lot of a lot of space. Um, so I'm putting it so that I can have them in the two parts and I can have the um, like slight rotation on the head of the character. The the problem that it causes that you can see actually in the spine is that whenever you change the name of the of the file it just completely loses the connection to the file uh, reference so I will have to fix the missing pieces but that's not a big deal uh, hopefully in a few hours I will have all of the animations ready and exported for Jeremy to use and kick ass but for now I need to continue working Alright, so something that's really been like a hell of a lot of fun that w took a little bit of time to really get it like uh, pristine and like supporting everything we wanted to do, but now that it's done is fucking awesome is uh, dialogue and the dialogue engine. We just have a shitload of fun with that. So this town has all the dialogue done. Jeremy's been doing uh, the majority of the dialogue right now. You talk to these people, they have lots of in-game stuff to, s to say now. Yeah, that might be important, so you might want to pay attention. But uh, while I'm on the subject of these NPCs, Patrick, what the fuck, dude? Their heads are like fucking ripped off. Whatever, that's beside the point. So I want to talk a little bit about how the dialogue works, how the dialogue system works, because we have a whole lot of uh, whole lot of variation in what people can say, what they can do, things that trigger different types of conversation, like. They might say different things if Julian's the one talking to them versus if Aaron is. They might say different things or be doing completely different things depending on whether it's day or night, depending on whether you've done certain story events. And basically any arbitrary logic can, can uh, cause a different flow of conversation. So the engine has had to be like really, really robust in how it supports that kind of shit. I'm not sure it matters, but I've seen this weird guy creeping around at night. Dizrella told me she saw the same guy in the museum staring at a wall and wearing a woman's blouse. Yeah, lots of fucking fun with this shit. I'll talk to one more guy and then we'll get more into the internals. This guard. I know you're wondering if this job ever gets boring. Well, it does. With the convention coming, things are starting to heat up. This is uh, right before the right right before the big convention starts at the, the beginning of the game. So. Uh, <laughs> Let me talk a little bit about how we do dialogue because uh, it's actually pretty important and it's very important in a game like ES that it's done well because there's a whole lot of shit going on here. So we can have dialogue change based on 
whether it's day or night, or even the whole behavior of these entities themselves, like they might go to bed at night or whatever. Uh, they can change based on whether Julian's the party leader, based on whether Aaron's the party leader. Uh, they can change based on where you are in the storyline, and literally any arbitrary thing can change the uh, the flow of dialogue. And there also needs to be complex trees where the dialogue, you know, takes different directions based on user input and selection and things like that. So in the toolkit, it's had to have a very like robust, uh, easy way to do this because there's a shitload of dialogue and. Uh, a way to handle all of this kind of custom logic. So basically what we have here is I've selected her and uh, the examinable component is where the dialogue's housed. Um, dialogue right here, it has three screens. So dialogue is basically a collection of screens, although these screens do not have to be linear. So the, st the start screen, as in the first screen that's displayed when you trigger the dialogue, is index one. This value can actually be dynamic from Lua, so, you know, it might be uh, Lua trigger might determine to start at index four if you have a certain uh, item in your inventory or shit like that. So each screen has text, and this text does the word wrapping and shit for you because it's smart enough to know how, uh, how wide and how many characters can fit in the uh, in-game dialogue text. And then trigger is very important. What this is, is basically whether the screen of dialogue should trigger uh, some special Lua event logic. So like sh this, uh, this chick might be like, hey, take this potion or this weapon, it'll help you on your journey, or can I join your party? And so the screen that she does that in, you would want to have a trigger associated with it to uh, call into whatever the, the hell arbitrary logic you want. Uh, yes, that's how that's handled. And then next index is a pointer to the next location in the sequence. So you can see one leads to two, which leads to three, it's linear. And the next index of negative one triggers to, uh, it desig designates that should be the end of the dialogue. So that's a pretty simple one. Uh, let me think of how I can show you. Because there's, it can get more complex with prompts. Oh, I know, the save, uh, the save point has that. So let's uh, let's instantiate a save point. Fucking hand is shaking trying to hold it still with my left hand. So prefab, right fucking here, and then interactive. All right, so save point. This is how easily we can instantiate prefabs. Boom, there's a save point. You know what, fuck it. Boom, another save point, fuck it. Like 20 save points, whatever, you get the goddamn point. So uh, these save points at least have a prompt within them. So let's go check out the save point, save crystal. HP and MP fully restored, would you like to save your game? No, not right now. But then if you push yes, it will save your game. And let me show you the way that works. So, Let's select this bitch. Okay, now look over here at selection view. Examinable, pop this bitch open, dialog. Screens, it only has one screen, or actually has two. The first one is just saying HP and MP fully restored, so this is a dialog text screen. This one is what's called the dialog prompt screen. In addition to text, it also has options, right? So it has a yes and a no. And notice these both have their own uh, next index set to whatever the hell they want. So they don't have to lead the same place, and that's part of the point. So, uh, let's see, that's how that works. And you can obviously very easily add new screens, add new options. So I just click that to add a new option. I could be like, you know, fuck off or whatever. Uh, part of what makes this really streamlined is, okay, the dialogue, two screens, let's... Uh, Let's say I want to fucking quickly demonstrate the dialogue without having to walk up and examine it. I can push the preview button. And boom, it's previewing that. What's even cooler is I can preview on, a, on an individual screen basis. So the second one is would you like to save the game? We can push play here and skip the rest of the shit because we don't want to play through all of it. And just start previewing at that exact screen. So. The system has proven to be very, uh, very versatile. Uh, it allows us to do all kinds of really powerful shit, 
And uh, yeah, if we didn't have the system in place, which we didn't for a while, it's like a complete pain in the ass, and it's not very, it's not very uh, sustainable to do dialogue like that. But yeah. Okay, so I fucked up, and I completely forgot that in a previous clip I showed you this reasted ass pause menu screen without any uh, any kind of information or any kind of explanation or whatever. So yeah, it kind of looks like shit. This is definitely not the final look of it. Uh, Patrick's been working on so much other shit, and I, you know, I was asking, dude, we need portraits, we need portraits, and he didn't get around to it, so I'm like, eh, fuck it. So these are the VMU icons right now as portraits. Um, you'll notice this is quite a bit the way Bravely Default does it with the, uh, the name, uh, the level, and then the class, and the class level to the right. For us, it's Echo, Echo level. So, uh, this has been one of the most difficult pieces, seriously, of, of Elysian Shadows and of, like, the game side of everything. This is fucking harder for me than, like, the dynamic lighting shit. The reason is because this menu system and underlying, like, this is not just a, a menu. Like, I have an entire, like, widget system, widget engine, and I have to do it like that because uh, this engine can run at any resolution, you know, like, it's going to be... 640 by 480 on a Dreamcast. This right here is closer to 1080. Lots of phones and stuff will be more like 720. So this has to be able to resize itself to to be able to scroll when you have like a big list that can't all fit like on screen. Here's some test bullshit. Um, and, and stuff like that. Like there's a lot of complexity that has to be managed in here that you wouldn't think about. Oh, and even more than that is this has to handle input from a uh, controller, from keyboard, from uh, clicking of the mouse maybe, and uh, also from touch screens for like mobile phones. And it has to be able to handle all of this in like a uniform way that makes sense, which is pretty hard. Like when you have a controller, obviously you have uh, w the sense of focus as which widget is currently being focused on. So like when I'm over here, that's the widget that has focus. When I'm when I'm uh, on the right, these are the widgets with focus. And obviously with a uh, mouse or with a touch screen, you can just click anything. So can't be hard coded like that. And the reason I'm doing this is one of the biggest and most important design decisions we made is that the engine is not customized for each platform at the engine layer. We don't want to do that. Uh, that makes supporting other platforms take longer for us. That makes it more of a pain in the ass to support other platforms in the future, and that's just been like a really big design philosophy for us from from the start. And so we always like keep that in mind, and it's paying off, it's just like, we have to do things like this a little differently to make it right. Uh, here's a test thing, every single one of these little colors on this gradient is actually a full-fledged widget in a table layout, and this uh, the screen has to dynamically figure out exactly how much space each row and column should get, and this this right here, is like totally 10 times bigger than any of those. This one spans multiple rows, that, that's blank, you know, and the, uh, the widget engine has to be smart enough to size and fit all that, so. Now that that's done, it's going to be worth all of the effort because it's gonna work fine on every fucking platform. It's gonna be fast as hell to do all the menus now. And little aesthetic things like the, the portraits can come later. All right, so while we're on the topic of uh, menus and widgets and things like that, I kind of want to show you from like a high-level design perspective where this is coming from and what the, the end result is supposed to look like. I think this is Dev Notebook 2 or whatever. Uh, it should be done, actually, being digitized. You're about to get all this shit. So I actually agonized a whole shitload about this menu system because I've played a whole lot of RPGs. There were aspects I like from some of them. There were some things that were absolutely horrible about them and otherwise like perfectly good menu systems. So I, I really, really went like full out autistic here on analyzing like all the different menus of games that I thought were, were pretty good, pretty well implemented. Um, let's see, so here is uh, Chrono Trigger actually, which I didn't like a lot of Chrono Trigger and the way they did it, but actually the way they did equipment and the equipment men menu was very clean, and I actually did like that one the best. So you'll see, you'll see pretty easily that I'm kind of taking aspects of certain games and fusing them with other games, and then like kind of making it our own too, customizing it. 
Um, this game really is, I think, a very good example of a mostly totally legit menu, but we still want some things differently in ES. We want to have more information and shit like that. Um, this is Final Fantasy XII, and the way they did a bunch of their menus, their equipment menu was once again pristine. And this, this is very good because a lot of the same kind of equipment shit that FF12 is doing, we have a lot of the same slots. And you can see like equip, remove all, we kind of have gone with the overall style of Final Fantasy XII. Uh, help information up here, a title, a subtitle. And if you're selecting like a weapon or like an item, the description is down here, sub menu here. Uh, another thing they did really well was they had uh, Every player could equip certain types of shit in Final Fantasy XII, and especially in the Zodiac Age remake, which is fucking awesome, you should play it. Um, so they had this grid which represented what could and could not be equipped, and what was already equipped and shit like that. Now in Elysian Shadows, I think it's kind of annoying for characters not to be able to equip whatever they want, and it, it's kind of like, not in line with our vision of like full customizability, uh, for ES, and uh, we want to respect the fact that players or the characters have their own unique feels and are uniquely good at certain things innately, but we want you to be able to take them in whatever direction you want to go. So for us, this would be more like the, uh, the, what, what did I fucking call it? The proficiency of each character with a certain weapon. Like uh, a mage can't just not equip fucking swords anymore, because it's a real pain in the ass when you swap classes and suddenly all your equipment doesn't work anymore and you have to go replace it. So a mage can still equip a sword, it's just their proficiency will be shit with it. So it won't be as effective, you know what I mean? But then let's say you master something like the, uh, the warrior class, you know, which allows you to equip uh, S rank sword proficiency as an ability, and then you can use that with the mage and you can still have uh, high sword proficiency. So that's kind of the way that we we want to do proficiencies and classes and shit. Um, this is more Final Fantasy XII. Oh, here. Uh, Bravely Default. Uh, I actually do not like a lot of Bravely Default, but it's, uh, it's a very good game to be looking at because a lot of the way that they handled their classes, um, not all of it, but a lot of it is, is very good, and uh, that's in line with a lot of the ways we want to do it with ES as far as the ease with which you can swap classes and as far as learning uh, unlocking passive traits from classes that can be equipped with other classes but we really want to do more with it so you can see here that our uh, as far as the player management screen is a fusion of Final Fantasy 12 meets uh, meets uh, shit where's the controller meets bravely default uh, with my own shit. So Bravely Default has the uh, the name HP and then like the class MP and class level and shit here. And then Final Fantasy XII has this whole concept of this level of party management and shit. Oh god, one of the sound effects is fucked. <laughs> Alright, so uh, yeah, I don't like a lot of I do not like the item screen in Bravely Default but though I don't like the equipment screen in Bravely Default either. Um, so, uh, after a shitload of analysis, this is kind of what I came up with for Elysian Shadows. Uh, you can kind of see already that this is basically implemented. Uh, oh my god, this was a lot rougher. It's really fucking hard because we want to have more shit displayed than a lot of these games, and we have lower resolution than a lot of these games with, like, the Dreamcast is at 480p. So, uh, yeah, it's pretty goddamn hard. This is what the equipment menu it's going to look like with the weapons. You can see here, uh, the grid is not just Boolean, it's uh, based on weapon proficiency. I really like the fact you can see how many are equipped and, equipped and how many you have. Um, so when you're in uh, the item menu, you, you'd click uh, up here inventory on the right, and then it would take you down to here. And from this sub menu, you would pick which uh, subtype of inventory you want to see consumables, weapons. This is weapons. And then right here, pushing L and R on the triggers will swap between the subtype of weapon. Like maybe you want to see the swords, maybe you want to see like fucking bow and arrow or boomerang, shit like that. So that's how it'll be. Down here is the uh, description and everything. 
Uh, let's see. Oh, right here on the equipment menu. This is very fucking important for us, is the status modifiers. And I think so many games actually ruin a lot of the the low-level metagame because you can't see uh, with like a very high amount of precision how exactly these stats are calculated and what the actual effect is on the weapon. Like, uh, a weapon might fucking increase, in, in Final Fantasy XII is a great example of this and it pissed me off, is the weapons might increase your attack power, you know? And then you would just see attack go up. But then, like, a katana would use your uh, speed factored in, so your actual attack output was not really based on this number. So I went, like, half the game thinking, oh, these katanas really suck ass because my attack's lower, when in reality, they were actually kick ass because it was not just based on attack. So in ES, it's going to be really important for us to show the stats breakdowns, like, how much of the stat is coming from your level, how much of the stat is coming from your, your, uh, your job, your class, how much of the stat is coming from your equipment or uh, armor proficiency level, and then how much of it is coming from, uh, let's see, what else was there? And then, oh, and then what is your total output for each thing? Like, if, if damage is not based solely on your attack for this weapon, then what the fuck is it based on? What is the integer with which you can judge how, uh, how effective the new thing is, so... Yeah, it's a huge deal for us. Like, I've really agonized about this kind of shit. And uh, I'm, I'm really happy with the way it turned out, but it's, it's very complex to implement. Obviously, we have, like, that's why I needed the whole widget system. But I swear, it's going to be, like, the best thing possible for the metagame and for people really being able to get into how they build out their characters. Because they, they have full control over every stat and they can see where everything comes from. And it's not going to overwhelm them either, because by default, you're just seeing this right here, which is the the overall output, right? And then you can uh, either click, mouse over it, or I forgot, push select or something, and then you can cycle through, like, oh, this is the contribution for my level. This is the contribution through that. So if you don't actually care that much about, um, you know, that level of uh, being autistic with your shit, you don't have to. Like, on the surface level, you can play it just, you know, caring about the main numbers, but then, you know, if you get really into ES, um, then you can go all the way in. So I've never really taken you guys in on the, the deep dive of the combat rundown, uh, where damage comes from, how, uh, you know, how your attacks ultimately result in uh, damage being applied to other players. Basically, like, the the heart of any combat system. Um, for ES, it's uh, it's a combination of fairly complex and very, very customizable. And we want it to be known, you know, if you want to know this shit or see this shit in game or see the rundown, this should be available to you. So that, you know, you know that increasing this skill or this ability will have this net effect. So what I have for the team is the ES combined stats calculations. So this is the table that I made for right here. This is uh, starting with your innate status for each character and ending with uh, the final combat stats or the final. So for example, like your, your attack power, your strength up here from innate stats going all the way through to how much damage you're going to be outputting when you try to attack something. So let's, let's walk through this and you guys can let me know what you think. Tell me, uh, you know, if you have any other ideas, or tell me, hopefully, that you fucking love it. And, uh, you know, if this is too low level for you as far as combat goes, that's cool, but, like, this is really important shit. So, innate stats, this is very important for, for, we want to make everyone fully customizable in the end, but it takes work to get there, and we do want characters to still have their own, uh, innate strengths and weaknesses that you can compensate for, but that's how they are by default, and they don't all feel the same. We also want them to feel unique. So that's what innate stats is coming from. It's basically your base status. No temporary modifiers. This is when you're naked, have no gear on, no echo. This is like your level one, your stat breakdown. And the way this is done is every character has, I believe we did 10 points to be allocated for each stat. And so the, the total net stat allocation of 10 
remains constant for every player, but each one has a different stat uh, distribution for how those points are sorted out. You know, the more the more magey characters like Aaron are going to have more magic, uh, less attack, whereas someone like uh, like fucking Alexios over here is going to be way more physically uh, inclined. So, but overall they're going to be equal in terms of their total stats because I cannot fucking stand games where, you know, a character you may like is just objectively shittier than someone else and there's no real compelling reason to ever use them. So this isn't going to be like fucking Pokemon, you know, where there's not really, there's not really any hope for a Pokemon like fucking, uh, what's a good example, like a fucking... Mm, like a fucking executor, like a fucking Jinx or something. Gen 1, no evolution, it just sucks. There's plenty of better Pokemon. Alright, so your innate stats, this lambda means that there's a function going into here. So these innate stats are passed in, and they're basically not, they're scaled, but in a more complicated way based on your level. To determine at that point what you're, at this point, this is how strong you are, with absolutely nothing else going for you at a particular level. Now here, these are permanent bonuses. Once you get here, this will be everything uh, at any given point in time, except you're naked and don't have an echo. Uh, we want this concept of permanent bonuses partially for the customization factor and partially because it, it can add a lot of depth and it can be a very uh, compelling reward for things like side quests or like super super fucking expensive items that you can collect or get through like I don't know like boss attack or something Pokemon is a really good example of this because they have items like zinc carbos a protein and shit that cost a fuck ton of money but then they boost a stat by one point you know so that you do have like some level of control if you're willing to put forward to do that um, permanent bonuses for us are also going to be driven by echoes um, when you have an echo equipped, so I'll get into that a set for in a sec. Um, the statuses are the stats modifiers are temporary until you master the echo. Once it's fully mastered, an echo like um, like a mage might give you feedback in up here and give you a permanent thirty percent uh, MP bonus. You know, so you have a lot of incentive to be mastering these echoes as like a permanent increase whether or not you're actually interested in playing with those echo types. So that's your permanent bonuses. These are all just set in stone. Now we get into some of the temporary um, instantaneous stats right here. Now this is the echoes and how they affect statuses. Echoes are going to be multiplicative. That's what that X means. That's what it means. Say multiplicative, multiplicative. Meaning that they are factors that are multiplied by your stats at this level, um, your, your permanent stats, to determine your instantaneous stats. So uh, something like a mage, you know, would have a multiplier of like 2 for magic attack or 4, and 0 0.5 for, um, for physical attack. You know, so it's, it's a multiplier that's added at that level, and it's temporary, and when you swap echoes, you're, uh, you'll be getting a different multiplier. The permanent aspect of the echo is when you master it, when it feeds back into a permanent increase, further incentivizing uh, experimentation with the echo system. Now, uh, your echo base stats are scaled in the same way that your level stats are scaled. Uh, based on your echo level, so the stronger you get uh, at like mage or something, the uh, the better the stats modifiers will get. So instead of maybe times two for magic output, it's times 2.5, you know, at the next level. Shit like that. Uh, after that, you're getting into non-volatile stats, as in like, these are things that, uh, you know, are very much uh, up in the air based on equipment usually. So right here, uh, this is where equipment comes into play. Um, your equipment has basically stats that are uh, hard configured to that uh, item or that armor or that weapon. And these stats are multiplicatively scaled by the equipment proficiency factor coming from the echo itself. So this is where I was uh, 
talking about before a, a mage can still equip a fucking sword, right? But they're going to suck more at it. So their uh, equipment proficiency will be like F rank at sword, which will like really scale down the, uh, the attack power of the sword when you're using an echo that sucks ass at swords. So now finally you have the additive completely temporary level of uh, status effects, buffs, and debuffs. So you know you could cast haste and now your uh, your speed is like twice as fast. You can cast some buff power that gives you higher defense. Uh, an enemy could cast some attack down spell. Or, or this can also come from uh, you have fucking an equipment that gives you a, a bonus, like maybe a helmet. Like Chrono Trigger, I think, had a helmet that gives you basically haste. And you can do things like that, and that's factored in here as the temporary status effect for buffs and debuffs. And so starting with your base stats all the way down to how uh, that stats contributes uh, to combat, this is the exact flow of how it works in our, uh, in our combat system. So uh, let me know what you think. Uh, if, you, if that was too much for you, that's cool too. But uh, this is, I'm pretty, really happy with this in the way it feels and the level of, uh, you know, how much you can experiment with it, how much you're rewarded for your experimentation, and how much power you have over customizing your characters. Kids, don't refactor complex systems unless you're ready to, de to deal with stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> and and it just keeps on going. So like, <laughs> what what is it even? Um. <laughs> oh Jesus! He looks like someone chopped him in half and stitched really badly together. Thankfully, I'm almost done fixing it all up. But there is uh, plenty of gems like that. I just want to show you because it's amusing. So <laughs> you can have some laugh with me. <laughs> like. Look at that. Wait, there was one which was really funny. Which one was it? It was like a side... Uh, it wasn't a pose. It was like a shooting. Oh, this one. <laughs> He's just spazzing out. He's spazzing out so much. Uh, it's, it's it's just the worst. I mean, like, what is it? It's it, it's like it's like when... As if Julian was... Uh, a target or a product of some unholy fucking experiment and now he's just like alive in this extremely miserable state of pain and suffering and wait am I describing the character or what I'm doing right now <laughs> um yeah it's um the good thing is is that I'm almost done with the refactor of animations so there is uh, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, but for now, I have some healthy laughs. All right, so uh, let's talk about some audio shit first of all. Uh, can you hear this? Uh, overworld areas first of all have different tracks, whether it's day or night. Uh, we have we will dynamically fade into combat tracks and uh, fade out based on. Uh, whether there are enemies on your ass or not, check this out. Looks like me there. It's a little waterfall. It's a little bit too much, but Jacob's been working on that. I don't know why the fuck that tile is there though, but yeah, he's gonna have to work on that. But I was gonna show uh, some shit. These need to be reoriented for 3D right there, but uh, let's see. So I think it was over here in this map. Wanted a, a good example of positional sound. Oh shit, I'm gonna get my ass fucking beat. Fuck. Hold on, fuck these guys. <laughs> shit, I forgot I was right about to level up. Get this asshole real quick. Okay, cool. Get their loot. Cool, cool, cool. Alright, so uh, anyway. Uh, it's nighttime in the forest. Check out the... Uh, save point. So the save point, can you hear the little crystally sound? That is uh, directional. So the closer you are to save point, the louder you can hear it. Do you hear it? Maybe you don't hear it. Hopefully not. You can barely hear it from over here. Suddenly you can hear it well. 
So uh, that's actually how all the audio in the game is that's not on like the UI layer. Like the boars and shit like that, their uh, their sound effects, player sound effects, it's all relative. Uh, it's 3D positional so it actually even knows your Z direction. So right here, you can hear it in my right speaker. Louder and louder in the right speaker, softer, softer. Over here, loud in the left speaker. Oh shit, now I'm pushing him. <laughs> Loud in the left speaker over here, softer, softer. So yeah, it's all positional as fuck with open AL. And uh, on, holy fuck. Why is my life gauge that big? I think those, the fucking boars drop some like heal orbs, I guess it's not, it's not capped, I guess, shit. Wait a fucking minute. Holy shit. Whoops! Uh, yeah, whatever, that was beside the point. But, uh, yeah. Oh, and on platforms like the Dreamcast, where you don't really have 3D positional audio, uh, as long as you have stereo, we're still doing the best we can for, uh, positional, and we're falling back to stereo. So, yeah, you're still gonna get definitely some extent of positional audio on basically every device, because I can't think of anything other than, like, a VMU that's mono these days. Oh yeah, this is actually an area of the game. You're gonna play like this. No, I'm just fucking with you. Uh, so, uh, anyway. What do you guys think about this shit? So, I've been, uh, thinking about doing this. Uh, let's see. A good good game that did something sort of like this was Final Fantasy XII. Uh, it's kind of like Elysian Shadows in that there's a giant-ass fucking overworld. But it's a bunch of separate zones, all of which are fucking huge, but they're connected together by, uh, warps and shit, and uh, this is just something I think a lot of games, like, first of all, old games did not do shit like this, that's why they're not as polished and didn't age as well, and it's really no reason you couldn't do this. So what do you think about, like, when there's warps and shit, it's, it actually tells you where you're headed to. Alright, so I want to show you guys something, get your input. Uh, first of all, I'm all about, uh, this is like a retro game at its core, but there are totally like a shitload of things that I think are not very polished about like old school JRPGs that have just done been done way better in modern games and this is kind of like one of them I think is uh basically like think about like uh Final Fantasies were really bad about this FF6 if you could examine something there was no notification or fucking anything like you would get the uh, elixirs or whatever from the uh clock face and you would have no idea you could go the whole game and not even know that you could interact with shit so part of that is you know like giving like notifications uh playing sound effect and shit so uh what do you think about for warps check it out to forest path so you know where the fuck you're going this is actually the first uh the first dungeon of the game to crystal ruins so you actually like can see where you're headed before you go through the warp but um, obviously if it's a place you haven't already been, it needs to show just question marks, because you don't know what the fuck's there yet. So, like, uh, yeah, what do you guys think of that? Because I'm all about the things that polish, um, Elysian Shadows. I think that, you know, this is very much a retro 2D game at its heart, but, uh, there's a lot of shit that modern games do that's just way more streamlined, and there's a lot of, like, shit that older games do that's not user-friendly at all. Like, think about, like, Final Fantasy VI, you can go the entire way through the game and not know that you can examine shit like the, uh, the grandfather clocks to find elixirs and shit, you know? So, we want, like, notifications when you walk into something you can examine, uh, feedback, you know? It makes it a lot more polished and, uh, user-friendly, and we think that that's, in that aspect, we want to be a very modern game. What do you guys think? Alright, so, I'm fairly certain I just found us a little, uh, Patrick artist easter egg going on here. So, uh, let's see, I'm in a menu, fuck, I actually picked a fight with these assholes that I'm totally gonna lose because I can't really fight well Well, I'm fucking recording, but I'll try. Fuck. Fuck you. Come on, douchebags. Come on, come on. 
Ah, uh, fuck it. Okay. Yeah, the blood's a little over the top. But okay, we're getting our asses beat, getting our asses beat. Oh, Aaron's dead. Huh, let me pick this asshole up. Ugh. Trying to throw him. Oh, Rand's dead. Come on, guys. Okay, everyone's dead except for me. I, uh, I secretly jacked up Julian's HP before I started recording so he wouldn't die out of order for you to see what's going on. I, just, I can fucking click on him and in real time go over here and up his HP and be like a cheap ass. Look, there's his HP. No, fuck, that's not him. Status, there's his HP. 40, 35. Alright, so he's about to die. Any second now. Oh! Poor Julian died. And they're still fucking killing him. Because they're savage. Which, by the way, for that uh, demo video, they were never supposed to keep killing you like that. For, like, the horribly graphic uh, death scene. That was a mistake. But... We thought it was cool, so we left it. But anyway, look what happens when you fucking die now. Boom! <laughs> Your VMU icon turns into a dick. Thank Patrick for that. We don't have all the assets for the other icons, so uh, I guess why not use a dick? Okay, let's talk card assets. Because that's that was the vast majority of my work for this map. Like, it was almost... Like, that's the... That's the stage that we reached with Elysian Shadows, like, all of the possible research that I could ever do is done, now it's time to make art assets. That doesn't mean that I'm not still experimenting, but, you know, that's, like, a lot smaller time allocation for, like, experiments. Like, right now I got, like, all of the methodologies, uh, methodologies set up, like, I've got pristine setup for making uh, character skins, I've got pristine setup for making tile sets and normal maps, everything's great, I just need to make make objects. And um no, I'm good for the like I'm good for the big picture of how the map should look like. You know, the general art style of the dungeon and the feel for it. Like I'm good for it. Like that's my strength because like I'm the artist on the on the team and I go with the like artistic feel, like how the place should feel like and that's good. But when it comes down to like coming up with specific rooms and puzzles for the dungeons, like, I'm a, I kind of break down, because, like, I, that's, that's not my thing, right? Jeremy made this gorgeous document, which is, like, I don't even know how many pages long, but it's really fucking huge, just for uh, the crystal dungeons, what we're looking right now, what you can see the tile, tile sheet here, and they've, they've put, uh, for, like, each room, they've put list of objects that they need from me, uh, to do to make the puzzle right and and that's great because i don't I no longer need to you know sit there and think in a vacuum what could possibly be in the dungeon like I've had people telling me what they exactly need to make their you know vision happen and i i'm I'm like I'm all happy for it so uh the 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 only difference is that I still maintain the sort of like artistic feel direction over it. Uh, here it is. Like here, like those two are great. So I'm gonna I'm gonna pop down the screen to show you. Um, for this one and this one, which as you could see, they're like in few color variations. So you know those two objects. Um, the way they were written in Design Doc, both of them were supposed to be um, statues of a face or a person that would shoot something out of it. And as you can see in the dungeon, the um, like, the, the general design for the dungeon is very uh, Art Deco-esque, um, in a way. Like, it's very geometric, it's very, like, here I'm gonna, like, overlay all the scene of it. So it's kind of like a fucking hoovering thingy. <laughs> um, so, oh, I could, like, place it here, shit. Yeah, that looks good. So, as you can, as you can clearly see in this, in this scene, the, like, it has this sort of Aztec, alien ancient but sort of magical feel to it and there isn't like if you would put a neoclassical or renaissance sculpture in it like you know sculpture of you know the thinker or however it was the guy called like you know the guy was something like that or fucking Ven venus from milo like it really it's really out of place like this sort of organic shapes 
they just don't fit in there. So what I did, uh, I've like I've talked with like what he exactly means like what are his requirements for the objects and for this one well he wanted um he wanted the statue of a face like sort of like those uh, like those maori you know uh wait that's not maori it's um easter island faces you know like this giant face that shoots a beam out of its mouth and i've took this uh, and i've took this idea and i like simplified well it's um it's a statue it's a thing that shoots out a beam out of a hole. Because like that's really the design need that he had, right? And I morphed it into something that will fit into the dungeon, which is, you know, this sort of geometric alien looking hoovering art deco. Like imagine this just like floating in there, right? Like that's just going to be to be right in there and looking great. And so you know I, I took this idea of his and I've put it into shape that will fit artistically with rest of the rest of the dungeon. The same thing goes for this one. Um those are actually there he needed some sort of like again face that would scream and the scream, like the sound waves that it produces, it would push out some objects. And I, I was like, okay, so we need like we need like a sound emitter, like a powerful sound powerfully looking sonic type weapon thingy. I was like, okay, I'm gonna like make it look sort of like um like a speaker and put it into the same aesthetic that we have. So, you know, from this sort of back and forth between level designer and and the art lead, we we're coming up with something that's coherent and nice looking. And as you can see like there's like um the actual map, the actual tile sheet for the dungeon is very sparse. Like there isn't a lot of ob there isn't a lot of tiles in it. That's because you know vast majority of them they're they're actually standalone objects because that way they can be pushed, they can be interacted with, they can be picked up, thrown, broken, uh, pushed around again. So you know like actually like most of the map is in the is in the objects, and you can see that all of them except like the very few newest ones. Actually, like only two, because well, this one it's in three color variations, and so you know, that's actually like two objects. Well, one has three directions. Like everything is norm normal mapped, <gasps> and except those two crystals. Oh my god, I need to do that. four. Oh fuck, I need to do them. Well, happens. Okay, I need to make them. But basically, like everything's almost everything's normal mapped, and also the also the tile sheet. And the guys, like you have no idea how happy it makes me. That we actually have like entire level normal mapped, because for the for, for the past uh, for the past uh, months I was really focused on churning out as much various pixel art as I can, because um, level designer can work just with pixel art, but uh, and they don't really need normal maps for the for the level building, right? Like level maps can be just added in post later, but um, so, so that's what I was doing, but. At the start of ES, like during the Kickstarter period, I put a lot of time into research of like how to make normal normal mapped pixel art look good. And for the longest time, I, I wasn't able to focus on it again. Like I've developed the methodology, I've de developed the art style, and I could kind of like let it slide because there were there were other priorities. And you know, so I'm I'm really happy uh, to see now like entire level in all its normal map to glory with lighting and shit. Like it was fucking amazing, and I'm proud of it. Um, the other things that I was doing besides you know the request for the new assets was actually bringing back the uh, the oldest pixel art that I did for for years and updating it with you know because like I've been I've started pixel art. For Elysian Shadows, and obviously, as I was doing it, I've learned a lot. So, and thankfully, the, those are not huge changes. Like you can see, the difference is that well, this one has some some gradient on it and outlines. Like the outlines and the shading style are really like, the main main two key things. And you may remember those from like museums and stuff. Like that's basically the museum objects put in back. So what I the other thing that I'm doing is I'm slowly you know going over and you know removing the outlines and making sure it all looks good together, and that's like not too hard. It's just time consuming. This one, this one, uh, funnily enough, I think I will just change the color of the outline to something more of a steel looking like 
because it's still like it's already looking pretty close to how it would look like without an outline honestly but yeah that was the um, uh, that was like the second big thing that I was doing second like area <laughs> of things that I was doing and uh, the other one was actually women you know now we have some women NPCs for the Laura so you know Erin is no longer the only uh the only smurfette in the smurf uh, village now we have like actual human population with some women and you know some of them some of them have little short skirts uh some of them have like long uh dresses and funny thing this is actually you know so it took me the longest time to learn the difference between a dress and a skirt and from technical standpoint this is actually a crop top and uh, a skirt just like like an ankle high, ankle long skirt because the, the bottom is separated on the pixel art like for the animation purposes uh, like it looks like a, it looks like a long dress which is you know one piece but you know um the things that you learn when you need to make a video game like the proper proper naming scheme for female clothing <laughs> um and then you know there's, there's also like some chick with um like with like pants and little little ribbon or necktie. Um, the other thing is that you like you will probably notice in a it in a demo. Like I notice it a lot and it like really, I really don't like it. But I have to bear with it. It's that um, currently, oops, that's not, that's not the right thing. That's the right thing, uh, and that's an object I wanted to load Julian. And currently, if you're gonna look, okay, so yeah, I can actually show you how the dress looks like. So let's uh, front pose idle. Yeah, let's show it. Uh, sides better. So like you, here, you can see like a chick, and and funny thing that like, this actual like separate bones for her that I added. So currently, I'm keeping both males and females on the same skeleton. Simply because I want to, I want the animations to be shared between the skins that I'm more that I'm doing. So, for example, if I'm gonna make some animation for Julian, uh, one of Julian's echoes, which can be like more like a mage type, then I want to be able to apply this very same animation on to more castery players when applicable. Obviously, like reusability of the things. But if I would have the files separated, if I would have like male skeleton and female skeleton separately, I wouldn't be able to do that. So I need to keep them together to share the animations. And then once I'm done with everything, I will simply separate. Um, I will simply like duplicate and remove the um, the male skins from female file and female skins from the male file. Uh, and the, the, uh, actually, like the reason why it's a problem, because like I still didn't explain why it's a problem, it's simply because of the skeletal structure. I don't know if you guys noticed, <laughs> but men and women sort of look the uh, sort of look different, <laughs> not the same, different. And on this case that I'm that I'm working, which is you know fairly small, the most noticeable difference between man and a woman, except breasts, uh, is uh, shoulder to hip ratio you know men have broader sh shoulders and we sort of like rectangular often hips are even smaller than our shoulders i think mine are um and for women it's the opposite uh, women have a lot a lot narrow narrower shoulders which makes their head slightly looking bigger because of the smaller shoulders and uh, wider hips than men so for the for for the in-game skeleton actually the, the change is very simple. I just need to push the arms a little bit closer together by like half a pixel, and suddenly it all looks great. But until I do that, but that would require modification of skeleton, you know. So until I do that, all of the women in the game will be looking like sort of very beefy butch girls. <laughs> but you know, that's the reality of game development for you. The other things I did was that like that's that's actually I was unhealthily proud of it, um, like how I did the animation, because it's a very simple animation. Basically, what it is is that you have those um, you have those tracks, right? And you have like little container thingy going along those tracks. That's like part of the puzzle, and we needed uh, we need like housing for the for the container. So you know, once the player gets the container, when when it's supposed to go, it sort of locks in. 
like you know here's like you can see here's like the round container would go inside it and the way i did is that so here's like the open so imagine here are like the tracks going uh here here are the tracks going out and the container slowly like inching its way forward and finally reaches the place here and then we can have the closing animation which looks like is that yeah that's the correct animation like that looks that looks really great like i was i was like and like all the little movements like look the the back is slightly bouncing because of the impact of the things falling like it's it's great and I, I'm I'm taking use of the spine control of the of the colors. I'm like fading them in and dropping from huge height. So on the screen it will be on the screen it will be looking very natural as they're like dropping from the ceiling or something. So you know that's like very little very little thing that probably no one in the game as they play it will notice. But I'm like really it makes me really giggly and I'm really proud of it. Um. So yeah, that's like in terms of the actual like working on the game stuff that I've done. Um, yeah. Yeah, I was gonna make Patrick fucking bloom these goddamn streetlights, but uh, if you go based on luminosity and uh, with high dynamic range, then they will automatically bloom them goddamn selves. Look at that shit. That's pristine. It's even like when it's night. Look at that shit.
Alright, so, let's talk about fucking rumbling. Um, a lot of work had to go into a robust backend for rumble support, uh, capable of rumbling properly on uh, all the devices and configurations and shit we support. On the PC side of things, you know, there's like 50 different USB capable uh, controllers. There's PS4, 360, I've tested with PS3, like a bunch of other shit. And, you know, for those consoles, if we ever come out on them, that needs to be supported. And you have shit like Dreamcast, where it's a removable pack, right, that we can't even assume will always be connected, that fundamentally has different uh, functionality than these. And then sometimes this will rumble, have different uh, device or effect support across like Windows or Mac or Linux based on drivers. So it's a fucking shit show to get everything working. So what we've had to do basically, so uh, is consider, for example, this has two motors, which means it can rumble in 2D. This has one motor, it can only rumble in 1D. And then something like a switch has three motors. Ooh. Well, not three. I don't know how the fuck they do it, but it can rumble in three. <laughs> so what we're doing in Elysian Shadows is every rumble effect, which we now have a shitload for like combat, for jumping, hitting the ground, like uh, for like charging the fireball and shit. It's always coded in the uh, script for the most capable, most uh, precise effect that can possibly represent it. So it's always going to be 3D, it's always going to use the fanciest nice. shit it can do. And then the libgyro internal backend is responsible for, oh shit, you're on a Dreamcast. What's the closest I can do with one motor that oh, can match that? You know I mean? see. So There's a lot of complexity that goes into like translating it that and, makes and figuring out the best thing it can do. And that's why uh, when people are testing this in the not so distant future, you have to let me know if you have like a rumble device that I haven't tested with. Uh, it should definitely rumble with everything, but it's possible maybe the way I'm implementing it is more intense than it should be. Like, you fucking jump, and then when you hit the ground, it's like... <laughs> and it shouldn't be that intense. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so here's the documentation of all the shitload of things that... Uh, shitload of different effects and shit that we support. Uh, yeah, I went to fucking town on diagrams and shit. Damn. And so yeah, not every device can do it, but every device should be doing the best it can do. This is an area that is in the spirit of like Peter's old um, shitty command line Perl scripts. This is a test area that has a real time like terminal that's like talking to you that you can interact with nice. at the command line to uh, test rumble parameters and shit to make sure that uh, all the effects are working for your device and so all that. So it's a standard one you would do. So long. Push T. These are the different effects. So uh, periodic directional I'm left looking at right. the wrong spot. God damn it. Alright, look. Selection view. This is where I can uh, fuck with all the different effects, right? Nice. So let's try out, just for example, I'll, I'll do a few of them. So let's do like a periodic effect. So this is like a periodic effect that's like sinusoidal. Oh, shit. That's why it's like a sine wave and it didn't last very long. You have to fuck Do a it. tangential wave. What the fuck is that? <laughs> I just made that Come on, up. There's a sawtooth. Uh, in this demo area, I did not want it to fall through if certain things weren't supported. So you could see actually what's supported on your device. Oh, it's yeah. a wild programming cat. Oh, yeah. Let's see. Let me show you like some random shit that is a better. Buster freaking Brown is eating your fucking trail mix. Oh, you shit! You beat him? He almost spilled it over. Why does he do that? Is he bad? He does that to my drinks too. Shit, shit. Buster, say hi. Okay, whatever. Here's some random shit. Well, you can't really fucking hear the rumble so well. Why? I mean, okay, I'm getting my ass beat, and it's rumbling. Oh, yeah, I feel it. It's like a nice little massage. And, uh, of course, like, drawing the sword, putting the sword away. is rumbling, it's rumbling directionally, and when we put it on the switch, if we ever do that, not saying we will, but we totally should. 
Uh, it will be fully 3D. So, uh, yeah. Nice. Alright, so uh, I just want to mention something about the, uh, the engine. So, like, leading up to getting hired by AMD, uh, up before the interview, like, obviously, this is the DirectX 12 driver team, like, obviously these people really fucking know graphics, you know? So I spent, like, a good amount of time, like, researching the fuck out of modern renderers, like, uh, Doom 4, Metal Gear Solid 4, Grand Theft Auto 4 or 5, whatever. Yeah, what are they on now? Like, 20? So, no, those are the latest games, like, what the fuck? No, I'm saying there's so many Grand Theft Auto. Yeah, that's the latest Grand Theft Auto. Five? Five, yeah. Shit. Think, or whatever. But... Obviously the most modern renderer, I would have been wasting my goddamn time on. I know, I just meant, I right. wonder which one they're on. So, uh, yeah, so, now I'm like, oh, all this, like, fucking epic-ass lighting shit, I know how to do it now, you know? And, like, after the interview, you know, I have all this, I'm, I'm planning, like, holy shit, I have to do this for ES. Well, I come home, and, like, think about all the platforms we're supporting, think about the state of fucking OpenGL on Mac OS. Like, I... I seriously was so fucking depressed, I would spend whole nights trying to figure out how do I do this like fucking awesome lighting technique in ES. Oh wait, OpenGL 4.1 cannot fucking Damn. do this. Oh wait, I can't do this. Oh wait, like, there were nights like I was so excited to work on ES and I just went to fucking bed because I couldn't like checkmate for That's the first depressing. time, you know? And like, so finally, um, I was able to get a lot more mileage out of OpenGL as you've already seen or you might see, but... This is with the inclusion of OpenCL for compute, because there's no fucking compute shaders on OpenGL 4.1, which is the Mac, you know? But everything supports OpenCL, and OpenCL can interop with OpenGL. So mm -hmm. the engine now has like this very complex, like very fucking epic uh, compute backend where uh, it detects all your compute devices with OpenCL acceleration, like your current GPU that's rendering the scene, if you have like an off GPU, your CPU nice. on a laptop like this, it detects your main good GPU, your integrated piece of shit GPU, your CPU, and it can dynamically assign tasks everywhere. Oh shit. So it's like an OpenCL thing, like CUDA can't do that, compute shaders can't do that, so I'm like, alright, well if I'm using OpenCL, I'm gonna use the shit out of it. So one of the first things that we've done with OpenCL is uh, I, I moved all of the particle uh, physics to uh, an OpenCL kernel, GPGPU kernel, and uh, yeah, so here's some of the, I don't want to jack all the blood levels up again, so here's just a video of when I did it, because it's fucking pain. So needless to say, the particles are so fucking goddamn fast, you can just shit out 20 goddamn billion of them, nice. because they're all, uh, updated and managed in OpenCL. So, uh, yeah. Oh. Yeah, so uh, the guy who was complaining about the particle frame rate in the last video, fuck you think now, bro. <laughs> Alright. Bloodbath. But yeah, the real reason I did this... Back up, back up. Oh, shit. The, re the real reason I did it's this... All up in your groove. Is, yeah, you were. Is because doing particles like this on the GPU, I can sample from the depth buffer and do screen space particle collision on a per pixel level, same way Doom 4 did. So particles instead that? of just shitting out, like, you know, just shitting out kind of on top of the scene and not really interacting the same way the environment does, more like a foreground thing, oh. it will actually be able to, like, blood will splatter onto a wall or a tree it will, like, in 3D. Off yes. of it? Oh, that's yes. cool. Yeah, yeah. And like that's not, you, there's no way in fuck you could do that on the CPU because it, like, you have to sample the depth buffer, which you wouldn't be able to transfer it back, sample it, and then do that. Oh yeah. What? I was just gonna say, can you make it like, look where it's dripping down someone? Yeah, that's what I want to do. Yeah, yeah. Cool. So yeah, that's that's like the kind of possibilities we have open now, and there are a whole shitload of like uh, modern rendering techniques that use compute. There's a lot of shit that you can just offload calculation-wise to these different processors and shit. Let me show you real quick. So what made you think of doing this? Like, Doing what? Using OpenCL. Uh, the fact I couldn't do shit without it, with OpenGL. Have you used uh, it before for anything? Uh, yeah, I used it in grad school for uh, some GP, GPU shit. And I'm, I'm a huge fan of it, so nice. I do have some experience. Oh my god, hold on, it's loading and all like, Is it confusing as fuck for like a newbie to just dive into? Open CL? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, it's more like, it's, it's more like Vulcan. 
kind of, yeah, it's not newbie friendly, but it's very, very powerful. And the thing that's epic as shit about OpenCL is it's, like, CUDA is 100% uh, a, a platform dependent as far as it's for GPUs and only NVIDIA. OpenCL is for any type of GPU and it also supports FPGAs, DSPs, ah. CPUs. You know what I mean? Why would anyone use CUDA? That's a good fucking question. Damn. NVIDIA. <laughs> it's because it's proprietary. Yeah, because they kind of like cock block OpenCL uh, performance on their thing. But alright, check this out. Uh, where the fuck is Wait, what it? What am I looking at here? here okay, Gyro Compute initializing OpenCL. So this is where I am uh, going through my your system when you load up Elysian Shadows and I'm querying all the devices, all the device capabilities. So here's my Xeon CPU. Jeez. Here's all the shit it's capable of. And then I actually have two GPUs. So here's nice. one, here's the other. Damn. And then determining hardware configuration, uh, assigning renderer platform, assigning oh, devices. Cool. So my online renderer device is this one, my offline's this one, my CPU's this one. If I had like an integrated card, that would be auxiliary. And then accelerator devices, if someone like in the future were to run ES on a platform with like a reconfigurable FPGA or some shit, I could hardware accelerate it to that. And this will scale. So like if you have four GPUs or something, I can distribute compute tasks and like leverage all that shit. It's freaking cool. And if your GPU sucks, I can just fall back to CPU. You oh know yeah. What I mean? So like fuck your GPU. That's or maybe awesome. you don't have GPU support. I can at least try to try to do it in software. So it tries all the scenario. Yeah. And I can profile it in real time. I can like, when you load Wait, the game, you... be like, all right, let me try to run the particle updating on this GPU. Like, oh, this sucked. Let me oh, try it on this cool. CPU. Really? And dynamically profile and decide, oh, let's, let's accelerate. Wait, how do you here. like change that? Oh, I can, it's just one variable. I can change it at runtime. I can literally be like, run it on this device, run it on this device. That's cool. I'm about to wrap it to the UI, but I have it. Yeah, that's what I meant, like, so for I have to, the I UI. I have to do it in code. It'll be in the UI, and it will be in Elysian Shadows in the advanced uh, graphics settings. Oh, I'll cool. let you, like, reassign it to in the fucking very, very advanced graphics that's settings. Cool. If you want to fuck with, like, I didn't know you'd have running a it on different. Like yeah, yeah, if you want to run on different devices. So, you know, guys, while. I was mostly doing, you know, game assets uh, for the past month. I still couldn't stop myself from doing little experiments here and there because, you know, in the end, uh, I'm a lazy asshole. I'm always looking for more efficient ways of doing things and I'm always looking for ways of making stuff better. So, one of the, like, the earliest, earliest uh, points of context uh, contention I had with the rest of the team when I joined was where Falco wanted to have animated tree leaves weaving on the wind and animated bushes, right, in the forest and make it all wave and be pretty fucking awesome. And my response to that was like, yeah, no. No. Because it would be, like, simply because it would be way too much work. Like, making... If you think like entire tree, which kind of like like this sort of thing uh, in ES, single tree is, uh, if I remember correctly, four by three, and then two additional four other two additional tiles for the trunk. It's like four by three. It's like twelve tiles of leaves, and two animated, which would like you would at least need like four more frames to animate it. That's like suddenly you know making this times four and it's like very intricate because like you can't just draw it willy nilly you need to actually like move the leaves accordingly each and single one of them on 12 times like that's that's a lot of fucking work and we simply cannot do it with just one artist for the scope of the game that we want to have like it's it's fucking not possible so you know and i explained my reasoning and we dropped the idea and we cut static trees ever since um, and, you know, bear in mind that we like one for one tree and ideally you would want to have like slightly different trees within zone. Like it just, it would be madness. Um, but that, the idea stuck with me. And there are ways and means of like animating leaves in the game efficiently. Like there are sort of like displacement maps along the vertices and stuff like that. There are plenty of things that people can do in 3D, but not quite in pixel art. So... 
I've I've come up with uh, this idea. Like I'm certainly I've seen it somewhere where basically what I did is that I'm having like the uh, like the tree is very modular. So let me show you the bones. So tree is composed of this sort of little balls, like essentially one in the individual bushes, um, and this like one animation file. Um, the advantage of it is that I could create multiply different looking trees on the same file simply as different animations by uh, by uh, you know rearranging the position of of those. So we could have we could have a lot of differently looking trees without putting a lot of actual stuff into VRAM, and you know that was like first win. The second one is. And I'm like, I'm, it's still like very much in progress, and in the end, I don't know if I will impl implement it in a game, and I'm definitely not spending a lot of time on it, simply because like it's it's just like an idea in my head. Like for now, like just making the game and not fucking around is a priority. But the idea that I make the animation is that I'm simply I simply have like a copy, uh, like this sort of cutout of leaves overlaid on top of. Um, like on top of the base uh, leaf clamp, and I'm fiddling around with you know subtly subtly moving the moving it and animating to give the uh, to give the illusion of of like individual leaves waving. It's definitely still not perfect. Um, like it's like it doesn't really look good. Maybe I need like two uh, layers of those. So you know like instead of just simply one like individual dotted leaves, maybe two of them, and sort of like move them around. Maybe I just need a different movement, because right now they sort of move randomly, but maybe they should be swaying. I've been talking with, uh, with a lot of pixel artists and game developers on Twitter, and we're, we're like, we, still, we had some we, we had some discussion on it. So that's something definitely that will come back, but for now it looks, uh, I'd say it looks rather promising. Like if you would see it as a like forest, like multiple trees, and then you know fighting with the enemies uh, on top like you wouldn't focus on this one single thing like maybe it could pass um i don't know though like for now i'm sticking with the tried um tried and and solved approach to making uh, um, flora in the game but i'm definitely like open to new ideas so if any of you have any idea how to add uh, let me know if you want, I can I can give you the files for this for this little project, this this tree test and the tree test two. If you want to like fuck around with it, because hey, uh, let's let's make yes great, right? So I was strolling around Boston and I actually saw the moleskin store and I found this limited edition Pikachu moleskin and I thought Falco and you guys because he's going to be using this for one of his dev notebooks so hopefully he fills this bad boy up and scans oh, it up to you <laughs> uh patrick uh why the fuck are their heads cut off look at that look at that like, uh, either you really want to fuck with me, uh, or your shit's a little bit reasted. I think I saw an even more fucked up one down here. Not trying to, like, call you out on camera or anything, but, like, uh, I guess I'm calling you out on camera. Oh, look at this bitch. Watch her, watch her. Focus! Jesus! Derp, derp, derp. Her head's bouncing too. So, uh, yeah. Oh, damn, her hair looks good though. The swing, damn, okay, alright, alright. I'm slightly impressed, but also you need to fix your shit. Yeah. <laughs> 